The Summer Fellowship Program is the oldest program at the HRC. It's been running since our founding in 1994. Our fellows come from departments and schools all across campus, both graduate and undergrad students, and they do field work locally, nationally, and internationally. Since the beginning of this program, the HRC has sent almost 400 students to over 80 countries and territories around the world to do human rights field work. Uh, I would like to invite any Cal students who are interested in learning more about this fellowship or would like to apply uh, to visit our website, humanrights.berkeley.edu. There you will find the link to uh, uh, sign up for a list of people who would like to learn more in info sessions and be informed about the availability of the application, which is coming very soon. Uh, you can also just talk to me uh, at the reception after the conference. I'd also like to mention that um, UC Merced, UC San Diego, and sometimes UC Irvine are partner campuses that participate in this program. So if there's anybody out there from one of those campuses, you can talk to me as well. The students you will hear from today were chosen in a competitive process based on their proposals to do human rights projects with partner organizations of their choosing. We will hear about each fellow's work, and at the end of each panel, there will be a Q&A, at which point we will welcome questions from you in the audience. Before we get started, I'd like to thank two key people for their generous sponsorship of the fellowship program, Professor Patty Blum and Dr. Tom White. Thank you so much for your generosity. Also, a big thanks to Ana Linares Montoya, Maggie Andreessen, Brian Wynn, Alan Ijima, Alexa Koenig, Eric Stover, and all the folks at the HRC that made this event and this program possible. So uh, today, uh, this is our first uh, legit fellowship conference in a couple of years. We're very excited to be back. Um, everything you are leaning on should be compostable, so please compost your stuff. Today we're going to start with a keynote introduction, then we will have three panels of fellows, four fellows each. There will be a coffee break in the middle with some yummy coffee and tea. And at the end, there will be a reception just around the corner at the Human Rights Center house just down the block. I invite you all to join us for the reception. Uh, there will be food and music, and you can meet and greet the fellows themselves and talk to them about their fascinating projects. Now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Nazanin Kandahari. Nazanin was a 2020 Human Rights Center Fellow. She came to us as a joint medical program student in the process of earning both a Master's of Public Health from Cal and an MD from the UC San Francisco School of Medicine. Her life experiences as an Afghan asylee launched her lifetime commitment to health and social justice. Her fellowship work in 2020 culminated in founding a public health initiative for forcibly displaced Afghan immigrants in the Bay Area called Afghan Clinic, which she currently directs even as she is finishing her medical degree at UCSF. Wow. Uh, she has conducted years of research across the bench to bedside spectrum at UC Berkeley, UC San Francisco, Kaiser Permanente, Highland Hospital, and the Dillon Lab of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She is one of the many program alumni that make us proud, and it's an honor to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming Nazanin. Good afternoon. Thank you, Alexi, for that kind introduction. Thank you all for giving me the honor of your presence here today. And a big congratulations to the fellows for all of the work that you have done and for all that you are. I think it's best to start with giving some context to my mental and emotional state right now. I just applied to residency, which is the next stage of training for me. I applied into a surgical subspecialty in which only 14% of the people are women. In which the people interviewing me, I have been told over and over again, will be quote unquote, old white men who cannot relate to me. I have been told that I should reconsider sharing that I am an Afghan refugee in my application because there are 
conservative yet prestigious faculty who will be repulsed by me. I have been told that I should be wary of being underrepresented in the field, as if that's my fault. <laughs> so I introduce myself to you today exactly as I choose to, and as I, how I chose to on my applications. My name is Nadine Kandahari. My friends know me as Naz. My family fled Afghanistan due to the war in the Taliban. They sought refuge in Iran, and the price for physical safety was high. I was born there, but I was denied a birth certificate for being Afghan. We weren't allowed to work, to drive, to go to school. Our existence was illegal, so we learned to make ourselves small. I only ever knew to be ashamed of being Afghan. When we were forced to come to the United States, we continued to live in the terror and shakiness of being undocumented. It's sad that one has to apply for asylum, but we did, and after many years, we got it. Still, we felt indebted to America for taking us when no one else wanted us. My parents didn't get to go to school, so now these academic institutions, they label me as disadvantaged. But because we were made to feel so worthless as refugees, my parents repeatedly taught me one lesson. That no matter what degrees, awards, titles, privileges I gain in life, if I cannot make every human feel valued and respected, then I have failed at being human first. That deep commitment to humanity, no school could have taught me that. So I am proud of my background. I am not here in spite of it. I am here because of it. When I applied for this fellowship, it was the easiest application I've ever written. I wrote from the heart. I wrote inspired by my mother and my sister. I wrote of a dream to combine the Afghan traditional healing practices with health education. The pandemic delayed that vision, but it paved way for new opportunities. I used that time to interview Afghan refugee women. I asked them, what do you need to live your best life? And I encouraged them to dream big. And more and more, I became a bridge between my privileged American world and my marginalized Afghan world. Yes, I used my research skills, but it was my personal story that gave me the crucial credibility to hear and receive theirs. I could feel for them as they shared how long the, in, in their entire first year of menstruating, they didn't know what was happening and thought they were dying how on the night of their arranged marriages they cried because they weren't taught about sex, how their husband justified getting another wife because they claimed that she was cursed with bearing only girls. We ended those interviews filled with tears and laughter, and they told me how they felt a weight was lifted off their shoulders how it was the first time since coming to this foreign country that they felt heard. They would call me a little sister and offer to send food to help me in school. And it was the first time that I, Nazanin, who defied every expectation of an Afghan woman, was told that I'm a source of honor to our community. In this past year, I've been asked to present our findings to the very faculty who teach me at UCSF, at Baylor, at many medical schools, and now I'm leading Afghan Clinic, a public health initiative for Afghan refugees. Besides sharing our findings in the academic institution and trying to increase representation of Afghans in the research literature, we lead health education. We just had an Afghan OBGYN lead an intimate series of interactive discussions about sexual and reproductive health and address those concerns and traumas. We have Afghan healthcare students leading sessions on common ailments, such as diabetes and low back pain. And we have non-Afghan students who are committed to serving refugees, helping us to make materials that teach someone 
how to navigate a complicated healthcare system for the first time. By investing in my idea, by legitimizing my change making, the Human Rights Center changed my path in ways that are forever and that I could have never imagined. And I don't take that for granted. Because outside of this space, they may label us as disruptive or troublemaking. They may even try to exclude us. So to the fellows, I encourage you to hold on to this community and to all of the communities that you've built with it. And I leave you with a few more lessons that I've learned. First, language matters. When we speak of the populations we work with in our publications and presentations, we must be mindful of our language. When we call them vulnerable or hard to reach, then we make them the issue which frees us of any responsibility to, to do anything. But the reality is they are marginalized, that our systems are hard to reach, our services are hard to reach. And thus the onus to make a change is also on us. Because disparities in life and health outcomes don't just exist. They exist because they were made to exist. They exist because of long-standing, ubiquitous systems, legal, political, economic, social, that stop certain people, groups, and societies from achieving their full life potential. And if we are not dismantling those structures, then we are complicit in them. The second lesson is to know what you want to learn, but also really know what you do not want to unlearn. I know we're all in graduate programs, medicine, law, public policy, public health, and we're all working in systems that were built on white supremacy. So I'm here to remind you, you don't have to buy into the culture of perfectionism, peer-reviewed publications, and deadlines. Please hold on to your compassion, your tender heart, and what drives you. You must validate your own values. And along those lines, the next lesson is to take care of yourself. Because these institutions weren't built to, and to keep serving people, you need to preserve yourself first. And lastly, center the people. Adrienne Marie Brown said that change moves at the speed of trust. It is with trust that we can learn people's issues, honor their strengths, and make our changes sustainable. As a Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, go to the people live with them, learn from them, start with what they know, build with what they have. But with the best of leaders, when the work is done, the task accomplished, the people will say, we have done this ourselves. I'm very much looking forward to learning about the fellows' journeys today and to learning about new human rights issues and solutions. And I give my huge congratulations to you all. I thank everyone for being here. And if you would like to learn more about our work, feel free to go to afghanclinic.com. Thank you. Thank you, Nazanin. What a way to keep up the conference, right? At this point, I would like to bring on and introduce our first panel of fellows. Please come up and have a seat at the table of panel one. The title of this first panel is Gender and Human Rights in Times of Crisis. We will be hearing from Fabia Yoshi, a doctoral student at the School of Public Health, Anthony Galli, a third year law student here at Berkeley Law, Kenneth Nyatich, who has just graduated from the Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism, and uh, zooming in or maybe appearing through a pre-recorded presentation, Wafa Alawi, who is a master's student at the School of Public Health. Please welcome our panelists. Thank you so much, Alexi. 
Hi, Namaste and greetings to everyone who's joined the live stream and a very good afternoon to those who joined in person. My name is Bhavya Roshi and I'm a second year Doctor of Public Health student. I spent the summer working in Croatia with Ukrainian women refugees trying to understand their unmet reproductive health needs. While working on this crucial topic, I had to make a quick pivot to working on a human rights case that was gaining international limelight about a woman who was denied access to legal abortion in Croatia. But before I move into the details of that case, let me paint the landscape of reproductive health and rights today. The Guttmacher Institute. Uh, the Guttmacher Institute estimated a 10% drop in reproductive health services worldwide due to COVID-19, which led to about 3.3 million unsafe abortions, 28,000 maternal deaths, and 15.4 million unintended pregnancies. That is the current popula population of Pennsylvania. The United Nations also reported deprioritization of reproductive health services in policies and in funding. It also reported rising fundamentalism across the globe and little to no accountability for reproductive rights violations by governments across the globe. And when we view reproductive health from this lens, the United Nations reported that reproductive health is in a state of crisis. So today, I'm going to share about my experiences from Croatia of utilizing international human rights mechanisms to advocate for uplifting women's reproductive health and rights. And that is applicable to any other state globally and even here domestically in the United States. So let's meet Mirila Kaveda, a 39-year-old Croatian woman who was in a stable marriage with a child when I met her this summer and was in an interesting and incredible predicament. She was, her case was a big news in Croatia and she was the topic of discussion for prime time news channels and debates. There were posts being made on social media about her and rallies being organized all over Croatia. So allow me to take you through her journey and I invite you to close your eyes and think about this case. In April 2022, Mirilla was six months pregnant. Upon her regular gynecological examination in the 24th week, a very large, advanced, and rapidly growing brain tumor was detected in the fetus, endangering its life and that of the mother. The prognosis noted that the fetus had a very low chance of survival or normal life. The tumor developed rapidly and time was really not on Mirilla's side. The law on abortion in Croatia allows termination of pregnancy after 10 weeks only if there are serious health repercussions to women or the fetus. Mirilla decided to visit a few other doctors but no one agreed to terminate her pregnancy. Some of the doctors refused to perform abortion on religious grounds some refused the procedure without an explanation. One could not even confirm the diagnosis, while the other claimed that they did not have the necessary infrastructure to, do, to carry out this procedure. So almost weeks after the first diagnosis and undergoing more than seven examinations, she was denied legal abortion in Croatia and finally had to undergo the procedure in the neighboring country of Slovenia. The cost was about 5,000 euros for the procedure alone that was initially incurred by Mirella. That amounts to about five to six average Croatian monthly salaries. I invite you back to the room. I know most of us feel for Mirella and her journey. What we also need to think about is that after overturning of Roe v. Wade in this country, millions of women and girls could have similar journeys, where they would be denied basic access to safe abortion services. The Good Matter Institute reported that there were 40 million women 
that are currently living in states that are hostile to abortion services. 40 million. That's more than the current population of Canada. So what do we do? Well, there's no one straight answer to this. We need to use several strategies and explore different pathways, including the ones that have already been used, like states opening up access to abortion care for women living in states that are hostile to it, telemedicine is being explored, consortiums are, be for, are being formed, and all of that is great, all of that is necessary. But we also need to use international human rights mechanisms and look for solutions outside of the US. So what do I mean by that? Let me share what we did in the case of Mirela Kavita. We gathered all relevant information about Mirela's case to create a report and decided to use charter-based human rights bodies. We sent this report to four thematic special procedures. One was the special rapporteur on violence against women, one was a special rapporteur on torture, one was a special rapporteur on uh, health, and the fourth was the working group on discrimination against women and girls. 50 organizations from the consortium co-signed the submission. We were interviewed in public, we went to TV debates, and we also made a press release on World Safe Abortion Day. For those who are thinking that US is not a signatory to many human rights treaties, yes, you are right, they're not. But think about this. One, human rights are interdependent and inalienable. So I'm sure there are several lawyers in this room who can think creatively of using international human rights mechanisms and treaties where we can hold US accountable. The special procedures are charter-based and are open to all. So that's the second pathway we can think of. Countries do not have to ratify any document. These human rights mechanisms are a product of years of advocacy from civil society. And their sustenance, it depends on our continued advocacy work. I can speak about more examples of organizations that have engaged in using international human rights mechanisms in the United States during the panel discussion. So in the end, no matter where we are, human rights are for all. International human rights mechanisms are for all. We need to use them to hold our states accountable for their failure to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights obligations. We need reproductive autonomy to be identified as a fundamental women's right and we need to pull reproductive health out of its current state of crisis. Thank you. First, I'd like to give a trigger warning for references to sexual assault and rape in this presentation. Imagine with me for a moment that you're in your living room in the safety of your own home. You put on a headset that transports you to a completely different virtual environment. You're there to meet a friend who lives across the world from you. Only seconds after you enter, however, you're greeted by the unwanted touch of a stranger. Imagine you're wearing a haptic vest or gloves, which translate the feeling of that unwanted touch to your physical body. Imagine you're 13. Now suppose that instead of you experiencing this, it's your child, your little sibling, your younger cousin, all from the safety of their own home. My name is Anthony Gatley, and last summer I partnered with the organization Witness, where I provided legal support on issues related to human rights law and international criminal justice. And today I'm going to speak to you about some emerging risks in online sexual and gender-based violence. Witness was founded in 1992 and was originally focused on the use of video footage to capture human rights violations. The founders were inspired by the now infamous video that captured the beating of Rodney King by police officers, which was recorded by a bystander and then disseminated widely. Since then, Witness has expanded in scope and works on a wide array of tech and human rights issues. Over the summer, I joined Witness's technology threats and opportunities team, where I researched exactly as it sounds, threats and opportunities created by new technologies. 
For part of my summer, I was asked to identify pressing and emerging risks for online sexual gender-based violence, or SGBV for short. Today, I'm going to talk about some emerging threats I identified within two categories. First, SGBV in the metaverse, and second, SGBV in relation to deepfakes. But before we dive in, what is SGBV? Well, it's really a combination of two terms. The UN Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights defines gender-based violence as any harmful act directed against individuals or groups of individuals on the basis of their gender, and it defines sexual violence as a form of gender-based violence that encompasses any sexual act, attempt to obtain a sexual act, or unwanted sexual comments or advances. Okay, so now what is the metaverse? To understand the metaverse, let's go through some key terms starting with virtual reality. Virtual, rea rea virtual reality is a digital environment that you can access through a headset and sometimes is even paired with ha haptic vests which allow you to feel the virtual world you're in through vibrations on your chest or your hands. Augmented reality is when your actual surrounded surroundings are changed on a screen that you're looking at. Think something like Pokemon Go or Snapchat filters, basically anything that appears to add to your reality. And the metaverse is really just a colloquial term that refers to the many social platforms currently available for experiencing virtual and augmented reality together. Think of the metaverse as an ecosystem that's like the internet, but connecting different virtual environments instead of different websites. And just to be clear, in case I've lost some of you, which I know I have, um, this isn't just a niche space for tech nerds or gamers. The metaverse already has over 400 million monthly users, so we should take it very seriously. In 2018, while virtual reality was still fairly new, some researchers reported that 49% of women using virtual reality had already experienced some form of sexual harassment. In October of 21, Facebook unveiled two metaverse applications, Horizon Worlds and Venues. Facebook rebranded as Meta and boasted that these two worlds were going to make a major contribution to the, to the development of the metaverse. Just one month later, in November of 21, reporters be, reports began to surface from women about sexual assault in the metaverse. One woman experienced verbal and physical sexual abuse within 60 seconds of joining the platform, and the perpetrators of the assault took pictures using the platform's screenshot features. In May of 22, a report by the organization Some of Us revealed that one of their researchers' avatars was raped just one hour after she entered Horizon Worlds. The report included other instances of groping, physical abuse, and gang rape. Some victims were wearing the haptic vests that I mentioned to you earlier, such that they could feel the groping on their physical body. So, what kind of threats should we as human rights practitioners and the general public be concerned about? First, the psychological impacts. Some research has shown that virtual experiences of sexual and gender-based violence may be interpreted by our brains as actual threats, resulting in similar trauma responses. In other words, this kind of violence is more analogous to real-life in-person sexual violence than it is to the traditional forms of online harassment. Second, this kind of violence poses particular threats to children. One researcher entered a metaverse platform posing as a 13-year-old girl and was sexually harassed by users who inquired about her age first. Third, and finally, there's also an emerging risk of spillover, meaning a higher risk of sexual violence in the metaverse when it is used in countries that already have high rates of SGBV. This spillover might also occur in locations of conflict, which would pose new challenges for, new challenges for human rights practitioners and investigators. Not long from now, Certain information about human rights violations and atrocities may be exchanged in the metaverse by perpetrators or witnesses, just like how that information is currently exchanged online and on social media. The second category that I'd like to very quickly touch on is that of deepfakes. Deepfakes, as many of us know, are images or videos that have been altered to depict someone doing something that they never actually did. So, non-consensual deepfake porn refers to deepfake images or videos that pornographically depict individuals without their consent. This is not uncommon. In fact, estimates show that over 95% of deepfakes are this kind of material. Like sexual assault in the metaverse, deepfake porn poses a similar spillover threat in locations of conflict or in countries that have high rates of gender-based violence. 
For example, malicious actors might use deepfake porn against activists, political dissidents, and journalists. Take, for example, the instance of Rana Ayu. I've lost my slide on here, I'm sorry. Rana is an Indian journalist and a human rights activist who was the target of a 2018 deep fake porn video that spread throughout India. In the aftermath, Rana stopped her journalism and activism for months. So, what does this all mean for us? It means that the way that online SGBV manifests is changing, and it's changing fast. It means that those who work in tech and human rights should center women, children, and defenders as we approach the proliferation of these technologies in regions where SGBV is already out of control. Finally, it means that human rights practitioners must be prepared to face the new landscape that the metaverse will bring to international justice efforts, especially in locations of conflict or the aftermath of atrocities. Thank you. Um, I come from Kenya, where I worked as a journalist for nine years. Um, today, I want to talk to you about um, this problem of uh, modern day slavery, and I'm going to look at the plight of Kenyan workers in Saudi Arabia. This is a, I was engaged remotely in this project. Um, and I was working with a human rights organization in Kenya called Muslims for Human Rights. So every year, um, tens of thousands of um, young Kenyans migrate to the Middle East for work. Um, currently, there are around 400,000 Kenyans working and living in Saudi Arabia, um, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. More than half of them are living and working in Saudi Arabia. Now, most of these are young Kenyan women working as housemates, and most of them work in servitude. I'm gonna play this video just to try and paint how big this problem is. Diana Chokimoi, who was stranded in Saudi Arabia, is back in the country. Chokimoi caught the attention of Kenyans after photos of her looking emaciated sur uh, surface on social media. A family led by her mother had appealed for assistance from the government to bring her back home. The 24 year old stated that there are other incidences of Kenyans being abused, the majority of which are far worse than what she endured. Goes on going with that story. Diana Chepkimoy returned to Kenya at 1.40 p.m. and was met by her mother, Clara, leaders, and friends. It was an emotional reunion as Chepkimoy rushed to embrace her mother. The 24 year old caught the attention of Kenyans after photos of her looking emaciated surfaced on social media. The photos sparked the problem among Kenyans who called for immediate action from relevant authorities to ensure she returns home. <laughs> Upon arrival, Chikamoy was waiting to tell her story, tears rolling down her face. I left Kenya to go to Saudi Arabia just with the hope I would get to live a better life afterwards. But mine, just to say, if I can just be honest, mine was just a tip of the iceberg. What one at a second? Who are suffering there? My friends are suffering there. It's just that mind, and if you need to that voice, you need to put a support when you need to be aware. People are suffering there, and I'm just living with the government. Just please do something. People there are mentally tortured, psychologically tortured, and it's not fair. And I, it's a shame being told there's nothing you can do. There's nothing what the government can do. I'm going to give you a few more examples uh, on the cases that I worked on. So that young girl, Celine Kanzi, she died in March after sending her family videos crying for help. Um, the official cause of her death was laser stroke, but an autopsy conducted by her family found a stab wound. Then we have Rachel Akini. Um, she also died after working in Saudi Arabia for six months. And what's interesting about this case is that the moment her mother learned that her daughter had died, she also collapsed and died. Um, then we have Martha, who has been in a coma in Saudi Arabia since 2015. Uh, for her case, she was admitted for a long time without no one, uh, in, no one in her family knowing. And uh, it took other Kenyans living in Saudi Arabia to come to her help. And they shared pictures of her, pictures of her uh, passport on Facebook. And that's when they were able to reach her family. 
but unfortunately, unfortunately, she's still stuck in that hospital in Saudi Arabia. And then the case that I showed you in the video, this case got the attention of the country in late August and September, uh, the case of Diana. Here on the, on the, on the far left is when, there's a picture of her when she was living in Saudi Arabia last year. And on the farthest, on the farthest right is um, a picture of her, you know, the picture that she sent to her family crying for help. So Diana, Diana was a special case because she is a bright young girl. She was in university, but she was unable to pay for her education. And she had to, you know, suspend her education and go to Saudi Arabia to get money so that she can go back to school and to help her mother raise her siblings. So the abuse, uh, this is basically because of this system called the Kafala system, which basically confines you to to your employer. It, you, you basically at the mercy of uh, your employer. Some elements of this system is that um, once your employer uh, gets you, you, your employer facilitates your travel to Saudi Arabia, they facilitate uh, your visa. Uh, and when once a young Kenyan girl gets there, uh, their passport is confiscated and they're not paid for the first six months until the employer gets back the money she spent on her. And what's even more alarming about this is that you can only leave Saudi Arabia with the permission of your employer. Um, Amnesty International released a, a report on this uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Um, they were looking at the case of Qatar, but um, it's, it's, it mirrors what's going on in the Middle East. So I'm, I'm just going to read you this quote from one of the people they interviewed. She was saying they bought me when they, when they brought me. This is why they can do whatever they want to do with me. And in that report, you can see a lot of women say they were shouted at, they were insulted or called degrading names. Some of them were denied food. Uh, some said they had been physically abused and others said they had been sexually abused. Um, so the organization I work with is called Muslims for Human Rights. It's based on the Kenyan coast. Um, this year, Muguri and uh, their partners have received pleas from more than 50 young Kenyans living in Saudi Arabia. So, um, and between 2019 and 2020, and 2021, um, official statistics say 89 Kenyans died in Saudi Arabia. Most of them were domestic workers. This year, we don't have the statistics yet, but uh, one watchdog placed that number at around 30. Um, so the Guardian did a story recently and they basically quoted a report saying, Saudi Arabia is one of the most dangerous places to work in the world. Um, so what's the Kenyan government doing about this? Uh, because this has been going on for so long, in 2014, the Kenyan government banned uh, migration to Saudi Arabia. And then they reversed that ban in 2017 after they signed some bilateral ties with um, agreements with uh, Saudi Arabia. Part of that was stringent uh, you know, uh, rules governing recruitment agencies. Um, and uh, one thing, one very important thing to note is that Kenyan workers in Saudi Arabia are paid uh, a monthly wage of $400. In comparison, uh, their Filipino counterparts are paid three or four times that. And this is why the problem is not about to go away. After, when, when, when Diana's case was highlighted in the media, there was a huge public outcry in Kenya. But what happened? This is the Kenyan uh, ambassador to Saudi Arabia. He came out openly to thank the Saudi Arabian government for giving employment opportunities to Kenyans. And then the guy in charge of the foreign affairs ministry in Kenya went ahead and tweeted this that over 200,000 Kenyans enjoy gainful employment in Saudi Arabia, and it's a huge boon for the economy. Uh, he was basically also echoing the sentiments of the Kenyan ambassador there. The bottom line is that money talks. Over the last two years, we've seen like huge amounts of money being remitted back home from, uh, from Saudi Arabia. In fact, it's, it's uh, the United States and uh, Saudi Arabia leading in the amount of money they remit back. There have been significant steps taken uh, by the government. There's a law that's pending at the National Assembly. It's not yet been implemented. Um, and then 
just because of uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to talk about this system, which was uh, it's called in the same system, which was um, developed by the Saudi Arabian government to try and allow um, people to monitor their you know their relatives in in that country. What can you do? Uh, basically, all of these cases. Uh, it's Kenyans on Twitter that have been pushing the government to act because uh, these these workers are not allowed to have their phones. Uh, but when they do, they share videos of their treatment and they share them on Facebook. And Kenyans on Twitter are very very vibrant lot, and they take they they basically in August there was an an election in Kenya and it was you know the, it was the elections of forming the bulk of the news. But Diana's case because Kenyans on Twitter uh, took it head on it got the necessary attention. So um, these cases keep cropping up from time to time, and it's that social media pressure that has really helped. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Lopa Adami, and I'm a second year Master's of Public Health student at UC Berkeley. This summer, I completed my practicum at Shafat Camp, a Palestinian refugee camp in East Jerusalem, where I learned about the issues facing women in the camp and surrounding areas. Today, I would like to share with you what I learned. According to the WHO, one in three women aged 15 to 64 will have experienced a form of gender-based violence in their lifetime, with intimate partner violence being the most pervasive. Humanitarian settings are especially susceptible, with gender-based violence affecting nearly 70% of women. These figures, which create the COVID-19 pandemic, are likely to have been exacerbated by the pandemic response measures. In the Palestinian context, gender-based violence is even more prevalent due to overlapping vulnerabilities, which are a direct consequence of living under military occupation. According to the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, Nearly 60% of Palestinian women aged 15 to 64 experienced at least one form of violence by their spouse in 2019. Staggering as they may be, these statistics have presumably climbed during the COVID-19 pandemic as studies suggest that stay-at-home orders, physical distancing measures, and closure of non-essential services significantly heighten the risk of violence to women and children. This is due to the rise in unemployment rates and the subsequent loss of income for heads of households, which can lead to substance misuse and untreated mental health disorders. This, along with the added pressures of land dispossession, destruction of homes, and restriction of movement, have all contributed to the disempowerment of women and girls in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem. Palestinian women are disproportionately affected by the social, political, and economic burdens of living in a patriarchal society that is controlled by an occupying power. Among them, refugee women, women with disabilities, Bedouin women, and women residing in East Jerusalem are prone to experiencing the highest rates of gender-based violence, including intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and forced marriage. Unfortunately, the most vulnerable communities also happen to have the least amount of resources available to survivors due to the ongoing pandemic, which has strained the already overburdened healthcare system and led to the temporary closure of shelters and other structures. Residents of Shabbat Camp live in overcrowded, substandard housing, effectively segregated from the rest of Jerusalem. Within the camp, there is a significant water shortage and an overwhelmed sanitation system leading to unsafe living conditions. The women and children face the greatest challenges and are amongst the most medically vulnerable. And with a single health clinic intended to serve the camp's entire population, access to quality medical care is nearly impossible. The Women's Center Shabbat Camp, my partner organization, is an independent Palestinian NGO founded in 1997, which aims to address these issues by supporting the social, economic, and educational needs of approximately 80,000 internally displaced Palestinian women and children. This summer, I went to Shabbat camp with the intention of conducting a mixed methods women's health study. I had a projected plan, but soon realized it was not feasible due to time and resource constraints in the setting, which is the reality of science research. I pivoted my focus and efforts on community projects, such as supporting the staff of the center with three concurrent children's summer programs, creating child-friendly water and sanitation hygiene resources, 
and creating materials for a refugee-led language immersion and cultural exchange program, among other things. But my primary focus is on launching a gender-based violence campaign in Shafat's camp. During an interview with a UNICEF officer, who I had been introduced to by a partner organization, we noted a significant rise in gender-based violence cases in the camp during the COVID-19 pandemic. A case that stuck with me is Sarah, a 27-year-old Palestinian refugee woman from the West Bank who was abused by and later separated from her Jerusalemite husband. As a consequence, she has not seen her child in six years. Unfortunately, there are hundreds of cases similar to Sarah's with little resources to address them. In an effort to confront the issues of domestic violence and gender-based violence within Shafat camp, the Women's Center and Ihtijab for Development proposed the following interventions. Launching a domestic violence campaign, which will be spearheaded by Ihtijab, an organization that has a long history of community development and women's mobilization in Shafat camp. They will lead a social media campaign that will address women's rights, domestic violence, gender-based violence, and workplace harassment, with the goal of educating the masses as well as producing data for internal research purposes. Following the launch of the campaign, we will set up a crisis hotline which will provide one-on-one -on -one professional counseling to survivors of violence. We will also host confidential support groups which will be led by professional counselors with the intention of validating survivors while simultaneously providing them with resources needed to break the cycle of abuse. Additionally, because this is a very community-oriented population, we have decided to involve community leaders in this intervention. This will not only ensure that the intervention reflects the needs of the population, but will also encourage participation in the program. Currently, we are in the process of submitting the grant proposal and are hopeful that we will receive funding for this project. In the meantime, please consider supporting the following organizations who have made strides in the area of gender-based violence and domestic violence in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Palestinian Family Planning and Protection Association, an independent nonprofit organization which provides sexual and reproductive health services to Palestinian women and girls. Women's Center for Legal and Social Counseling, a non-governmental organization that aims to address the causes and consequences of gender-based violence within the Palestinian community and Palestinian Counseling Center, a non-governmental organization that provides comprehensive mental health services to Palestinians in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Thank you. So I have a question for Anthony, which is, I um, really appreciated your presentation in all three or four presentations. Um, but I want to know what uh, like legal mechanisms or cases have been filed, if any, um, around the issues that you've been talking about and how those are being adapted to fit the like digital world. Yeah, thank you. Oh, this works incredibly well. That's so cool. Um, with the little microphone. Uh, so I'm not aware currently of any legal filings that have happened domestically or internationally on any of these cases. And I think that in itself is quite telling. Um, I think one of the things to note in terms of the legal landscape is not only am I not aware of any filings, but the landscape itself remains unbelievably undeveloped. Um, I mean, the landscape for sexual and gender-based violence within international law is quite underdeveloped, and so it's not too much of a surprise, unfortunately, that as unprepared as we are as lawyers and activists um, and human rights practitioners for on the ground, real life, if you want to call it sexual and gender-based violence, that we that our, that our frameworks and our institutions and our legal systems are wholly unprepared to deal with that kind of spillover into and out of um, environments like the, metal, the metaverse. Um, but yeah, I think that that's one of the things that was most shocking to me when I started to research this over the summer um, was just how unprepared we are. Uh, and I think as my panel mates demonstrated, sexual and gender-based violence in the real world is absolutely you know nothing to scoff at in terms of the numbers and the statistics um and so it should only be more jarring to us in light of their presentations uh how unprepared we really are and how worried that should be for us given just how real a virtual environment is shaping up to be 
got another question over here. Uh, the questions for Kenneth. Um, I'm curious, from just the course of your work, too, how what does abolition of the Kabbalah system look like right now? Is that an, is that an area of, of coverage to the news? Sorry, I didn't get that. Um, in terms of abolition of the Kabbalah system within the, the Gulf states. Well, um, I think there's been a lot of talk and pressure from uh, human, rights, human rights agencies across the world for the abolition of that. Um, I talked to uh, people who have been engaged in that, and they said they're seeing little progress, um, but it's not being abolished to the scales that, um, that, that, they, that people want. So um, what normally happens is that when these cases are brought to, say, the Saudi Arabian ambassador in Kenya, they automatically deny it. They say these are not happening. So it's really hard to to gauge exactly what they're doing in Saudi Arabia, but um, it doesn't look like this system is going to be abolished anytime soon. Another question here in the back. Um, thank you all. This is really scary and, uh, <laughs> and also really interesting. For Kenneth, I have a question. I'm I'm, I'm uh, from South Asia, and I know that the abuse of domestic workers is a shared experience among many Asian and, and African communities. And I'm wondering if you've seen that that shared experience has resulted in any like solidarity or groups working on that together. Um, I was thinking about it today, listening to news about Los Angeles and the city council drama there between Latin and black communities, and wondering if these shared experiences are actually like helping in this setting. Um, none that I'm aware of, but I know that the Philippines did a lot of the, the Filipino government did a lot of engagement and pushback against the Saudis, and that helped a long way because um, Kenya is borrowing a lot from the kind of bilateral agreements the Philippines and the Saudi Arabian government have. Um, in as much as, uh, as far as uh, engagement uh, between the workers themselves, I don't know. I'm not sure. W what happens for sure is that there is a vibrant Kenyan community in Saudi Arabia, and um, when they get reports that one of them is being abused, they try to help. In fact, I talked to um, a man who was working as a driver in Jeddah. A Kenyan man, um, he was he was he was a true advocate for the respect of uh, the migrant workers, uh, migrant workers. And uh, when the Saudi Arabian government noticed that he was being so loud about it, they deported him. Question over here. Was there any discussion of this issue in the recent election for president in Kenya in terms of what the government should or could do or did not has not done? Is it an issue between the candidates and the parties? Yes. Um, so um, Diana, Diana's case, uh, Diana was fortunate enough to for her case to be elected during uh, the election period. And um, because of that very big pushback from, from Kenyans uh, online and um, in person, uh, the government promised to sort of uh, engage the Saudi Arabian government more on this. Uh, but you have, when you see people like the, the, the head of uh, the Foreign Affairs Ministry saying that we thank Saudi Arabia for the kind of, you know, the number of jobs they provide for Kenyans. It erodes the confidence Kenyans have on them because the government seems to be more interested in the amount of money being sent back home than the plight of its citizens there. But um, people are starting to take these things seriously. I know that those laws that have been shelved are being discussed right now. Um, the Senate of Kenya has uh, promised to relook that. And so it remains to be seen exactly where. The good thing is that sometimes so many cases 
come up, sometimes there are no cases, but this this is an ongoing problem. We can go for like another one month with, with no with no cases, but then they come up and the pressure is turned right back on. Okay, do we have some questions that are not for Kenneth? <laughs> I've got one. Thank you. This is just for the video recording. So this is a question for Fabia. Uh, it was really inspiring to learn about your, your project uh, this summer and to learn that in Croatia, which is apparently a signatory to some human rights conventions, uh, human rights mechanisms have been helpful in advocating for this young woman and for other women in need of abortion or other reproductive care that are being denied that care because of the religious preferences uh, of doctors and perhaps built-in discriminations to the state system. Um, given what's going on in the United States right now, the recent loss of Roe versus Wade, and also the looming threat of some conservative uh, activists attempting to ban or diminish access to contraception, something that uh, the HRC is doing some reporting on right now. I would like to know, are, are there any human rights approaches, human rights mechanisms that could be useful in the United States? Thank you for that question, Maxine. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I want to begin with acknowledging that it's a great privilege to sit on a panel on gender and human rights with two people who do not identify as women. This is groundbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> so feels great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Alexi, the simple answer to your question is yes, there are. Um, like I mentioned, we have to start looking at human rights treaties that have been ratified by the United States. So for example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, Article 6 uh, is on right to life. And there has been a lot of literature on how not having access to health is also a violation to right to life because you cannot have a good life. You cannot have life if you don't have access to health, right? And they are correlated and interdependent. And so we have literature where countries have held uh, have been held accountable for violating Article 6 if they're not providing proper health services. In addition, ICCPR also Article 17, 23, 24, there's several articles that are on right to family, right to privacy, right to have a child, all of that. And if we interpret human rights uh, mechanisms progressively, then we can say that, you know, right to abortion or right to reproductive health has not been provided by US and we can hold them accountable in these human rights uh, treaty bodies. So that's one pathway. The other, like I said, is going up to special procedures. So the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls made a visit to the United States during the Obama administration. They came to see what are the, where, are, where is the state not fulfilling its human rights obligations with upholding all sorts of women rights, but also reproductive health and rights. And so those are ways of engaging with the special procedures where we can send them reports when they have um, called for submissions for thematic uh, annual reports that they have. We can ask them to make a country visit to experience the violations themselves and see it firsthand and then report it back to the United Nations so that they can hold US accountable um, and then blaming and shaming, which we very well know in human rights works for some countries, is also perhaps a pathway that can be explored. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Hi. Um, I'm, thank you so much. I graduated from here many, many moons ago, and it's so refreshing to come here and to see you guys so engaged, and it just fills me with joy to see you here today. Um, I wanted to ask you a practical question. What happens to a woman, like the woman you were talking about from Croatia, who talked about you know, human rights violations and, and starting a process to assist, but the woman on the field, the woman in, in there who discovers that she's pregnant, and so time is of the essence. What is available for such a person? That's a great question. Thank you so much for your question. Um, so in case of Virila, 
her first step was obviously to exhaust all public hospitals in the region where she was. Her second step was reaching out to organizations that work on ground on sexual reproductive health. So for example, my partner organization, RODA, is a citizen-led organization in Croatia that works in reproductive health and has been doing so for the past two decades. And so she knew this is a place where she could reach out to for help. And once she did that, the NGO and the civil society organizations start getting involved in ensuring that you do have better access to reproductive health services. In her case, when she visited all these hospitals, they denied and they knew that perhaps entering the public health system, given the political environment in the country, might not be the best pathway for her. They decided to organize rallies and make it more public and start talking about it, which built a lot of internal pressure on the government. And the government, within the span of four to five weeks, which is a lot for a pregnant woman and during her pregnancy, but in, in a span of four to five weeks, was able to say, okay, no, we're gonna make sure that she gets uh, abortion services. And they supported her, they gave her the finances that were needed. And so, you know, through the help of these local institutes and civil society organizations, her case uh, was able to be a, to have a successful outcome, at least the one that the woman desired. Thank you to everyone. Um, my question is from Ms. Joshi, is that how you say it? Um, yes, thank you. I know in the U.S. a lot of young women that I've spoken to has um, openly discussed an option for sterilization. And my question is, uh, women in other countries, uh, do they even have access to that option? And is it something that is even being thought about or discussed, or they're so far away from having any resources available that that's kind of not even something they think about. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And I'll refrain from making some blanket statements here, but at least in the context of India, where I come from, sterilization is a commonly provided contraception method. It is something that is supported by the government. And so the smallest village in India would have access to sterilization. Um, that is also to say that, religiously speaking, there are a lot of um, India mostly is a Hindu nation with other minorities, but the religion does not necessarily object with reproductive health uh, services, maybe contraception, abortion, all of that. Hence, it is easier to implement sterilization and practices like that in countries like India. But of course, there are countries which follows other religions where it might be more restrictive, and we understand that. But Sterilization as a process, even I can speak for some countries in Africa where it has been provided on ground uh, with governments endorsing it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your presentations. I was wondering, since Croatia is a member of the European Union, uh, mm -hmm. was it at all the possibility to bring that case to the European Courts of Human Rights? And if yes, uh, was it done? If not, why not? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that question. Um, yes, Croatia is part of the European Union, and so one of the parts that they can explore as a country is to go to the European Court. In this case, we did not decide to go to the European Court. One, because we needed to expedite, right, and there is waiting, as you would know. With European Courts, you can't just go and have a, a resolution in, in a few weeks. Um, we decided to um, go to the special procedures where we could just quickly send it, send the report and have some pressure come in from the international bodies as well. But one of the things with um, approaching international courts is that you have to first exhaust domestic remedies. And when you, it, it takes time for anybody to exhaust remedy, domestic remedies. And in Mirila's case, she had not fully exhausted all domestic remedies and hence we could not at that moment go to say the European court or even uh, other regional mechanisms or explore them. So that's why we decided to go to special procedures, which was a low hanging fruit. Ivana Radarich, uh, who is an ex uh, who's a member of the working group on discrimination against women, which is one of the special procedures, uh, is from Croatia and she got on board with this case. So she was also very helpful in expediting 
the process and making sure that it reaches to the necessary bodies. Thank you. I'm going to hold in with a quick question for the entire panel. I'm going to do Anthony would like to kick this yes. off. I'm curious, what overlaps the three of you discovered across your work? You're, you're working in different countries on different issues, but it's all related to sexual and gender-based violence. And I'm just interested to hear what synergies and thoughts you have from one another's work. I think the the amount of sexual and gender-based violence, and this seems like such an obvious point, but it relates really interestingly to what I researched um, over the summer, uh, which is the, the amount of sexual and gender-based violence that occurs in particularly patriarchal societies um, is, I mean, it's absolutely disproportionate to where it occurs elsewhere in the world, which is just something of note when we're looking at the proliferation of something like the metaverse and a virtual reality. Um, most of the most of the human rights organizations and people on the ground that have sounded the alarm on you know the impacts and the misuse of uh, environments like the metaverse have come out of uh, Gulf states, the Middle East and North Africa. A lot of research has come out of researchers in Pakistan in particular. Um, who are really, really concerned about uh, what's going to happen for women, children, and human rights defenders on the ground in those countries. Uh, so it, I think that that's a really interesting overlap because of the work that um, all of my panel mates, including uh, with it, you know, the regions that they worked on. Um, for me, I would say um, the crucial space of social media in highlighting this because thanks to Facebook um, most Kenyans are able to know what's happening in Saudi Arabia and thanks to Twitter um, Kenya has a really really vibrant Twitter community and they push things they push the government to, 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 to do things so this the, the place of social media in the fight for human rights I would say is what I would say. Mm. Um, yeah, I think I think our both the panelists have covered most of what we discussed this summer. But I would just like to add that in in this panel, we're talking about a set of human rights that we feel are neglected. We feel it needs more work in. We feel that these are spaces that. For example, when, when we talk about women refugees, in Bafa's case, in, I was also working with Ukrainian women refugees this summer, or women who, are, who do not have access to, say, abortion, or gender-based violence, face gender-based violence. These are all women who, who've had extreme circumstances. They've not necessarily had access to um, legal systems. And these are spaces which are not necessarily being worked on a lot at the moment. And I, we felt that this is this is a space where we kind of wanted to bring it together and talk more about it from the lens of, say, gender, and then more more use of human rights mechanism and human rights in general where it amplifies their voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any final burning questions before we move on to the next panel? Burning ones. All right, well, in that case, please give a warm round of applause. We will hear from Violet Barton, who is a PhD student of Interdisciplinary Humanities at UC Merced, Yunchang Cho, who is a PhD student in Sociology at UC San Diego, Adeshewa Adesina, who's a master's student at the Goldman School of Public Policy here at UC Berkeley. She will be joining us via Zoom. Yes. And Malak Afana, who is a second year law student here at Berkeley Law. Please welcome our next set of student panelists. I acknowledge that I am on the unceded and occupied territories of the Chinchincho Ohlone peoples and nation. And I'm grateful for that and come here with humility. I'm here also grateful to come to you with permission from my abuelos and abuelas, with gratitude, 
that they allow me to be here and also asking for forgiveness for any errors that I may make in sharing these knowledges. Yektayua Muji. Nahanu to gain violet or Tunyewa, Kushkatan, Pan Yusi Merced, Niyo Palki, Nechani, Yetni Mechis Mati. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Violet Barton. I am a person from El Salvador who fled during the war. I go to UC Merced, and what I said is that I am grateful to be here. My heart is content, and that my eyes recognize you today. El Salvador has histories that are rooted in colonialism, empire, and war for over 500 years. These histories are not over. We struggle with military regimes. Um, we struggle with war, U.S. intervention. We struggle with corrupt governments, impunity. We struggle with poverty, lots of economic inequality that are made worse by economic um, neoliberal policies, right? We are struggling with homicide, the highest homicide and femicide rates in the hemisphere, which has made El Salvador one of the most dangerous countries in the world during this time. Yet, you know, many, most of these violences that take place every day for our families force them to be internally displaced many times before they are forced to migrate to international borders where they are not loved. Additionally, this um, violence is right, affect the most marginal, the marginalized communities disproportionately. And so what we don't know as much about El Salvador is about indigenous peoples and their histories. We almost never hear about that. But I'm here to tell the story of my ancestors and what we are struggling with today. Um, since the 1932 Matanza in El Salvador that was sponsored by the government, in a matter of three to four weeks, over 30 to 50,000 indigenous, mostly men and women, were killed. Their bodies are still buried in the ground in mass graves that are not identified. And so for indigenous communities, specifically the Nahuatl communities in Western El Salvador, their struggles are centered on the land. Their survivance is centered on the land. And so I wanted to share with you a quote by Tata Nicolas Sanchez, who is a spiritual guide and a land defender, right? And he says that our abuelos and abuelas transformed the sacred corn over thousands of years using indigenous sciences so that we could survive. We have a right to exist here in these lands. For Tata Nicolás uh, Sánchez, the struggle is water and land center. Tata Fidel, Tata Fidel is also the person who the person that I work with, right, that. for the summer, right, and he says that corn is the blood of the land, right, that corn gives us sacred energy that comes from the sun to the land, and that's that that be there, right, so, and he says that for us, it is important to, um, understand our connections, right, that come from the sky, to the land, to the plants, and that we all are connected. When my feet touch the ground, that there's no divisions, right? I am one with the ground, where the branches of a tree end, I begin. So this is an our philosophy about land. And for us, you know, understanding land not as property, but land as life is important. And so for that, it's important for us to know that their struggles to ratify the International Labor Organization Convention 169 
are critical because they're fighting for life. Uh, one of the things that we did this summer with the indigenous communities with um, the Asociación de Coordinadora de Comunidades Indígenas is to try to gather together a project of digital, digital interviews from indigenous, indigenous organizers who have been fighting to ratify this convention. The convention gives indigenous people basic rights, uh, human rights, the right to live on the land, the right to cultivate, to use seeds, to speak your language, to name people and places using your language, to cultural dress and customs and traditions, right? And so one of the things we did is try to record interviews of the indigenous people who have been doing this for over 20 years, but we are not able to do that because at this moment, El Salvador has a state of exception. In the last six months, over 55,000 people have been forcibly detained and disappeared. Some of them are indigenous peoples. And so in this crisis where we cannot speak because we don't have rights, we don't have human rights, we don't have civil rights and protections, new life came to this crisis. And we worked together with many others who decided to organized differently and what we're doing is you know collecting some interviews creating that archive which you can visit visit at axias.org um, but also you know under the work of other indigenous leaders like that uh, daniel flores de Asensio, who is one of the original organizers of the u.s uh, u.s out of the Central American intervention in the 1980s. We are now asking poets to step up to the plate and help us create poetic actions every day against this type of violations. Um, we also have created the a special commission for indigenous peoples uh, for human rights because one of one indigenous leader was arrested, detained, forcibly disappeared with six of his children, right? And we have no resources to fight this kind of um, atrocities. Uh, we created colectivomilpa.com so you can visit there, learn more about the struggles about indigenous communities in El Salvador. We are planning an indigenous congress, which is for, for um, 2023, which is one of a kind where indigenous people from the northern triangle, quote unquote, which we call the triangle of life, will be able to talk about decolonization and anti-colonial movements. And so I invite you all to visit these websites that are going to be available to you to learn more and to join us in mutual aid and in restoring human rights and sovereignty, especially intellectual sovereignty. Because most of the research produced about Central American indigenous communities is by Western researchers, right, who come and extract practices and then they leave and we are left without dignity and humanity. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time and thank you for listening. Have you watched the Korean movie, Hell Fight? Yes. It is the first non-English language film to watch um, to win the best picture at the Academy Awards. In the movie, When It Rained Heavily, a house of a poor family floods and all of their things, including their blankets, cloth, and books, were submerged. My advisor at UC San Diego watched the movie and asked me the question, where these kinds of things are really happening in Korea? Or it's just a story made up for the movies? Here's my brief point. I took these photos this summer in South Korea. In 2022, this summer, a heavy rain caused some neighborhoods in Seoul to flood. Although it rained over um, throughout the Seoul, not all houses were affected. Most of the affected houses were semi-basement house, which is called Banji Ha in Korean. Many young people and low-income people live there because they cannot afford to live elsewhere. Zhong Guan, a young man in his 20, moved into this house, small, tiny, semi-basement housing a year ago. But the rain and flood 
Housing to lose everything in this house, including his favorite guitar, memory books, and all his electronics. He said he lost about 10,000 US dollars worth of items, and he had to find a temporary housing for a month. Hello, my name is Eun Chong. I study at UC San Diego. I study sociology and focus on human rights movements. My research interest includes how local people incorporate international human rights ideas into their local activism. This summer, with the support of the Human Rights Center, I worked with a housing rights movement organization, which is called Mean Snail Union. Mean Snail refers to snail without shell, and they use the symbol to represent young people without homes. They started their activism at Yonsei University in Seoul to demand more affordable housing for young people, their students. But it, in 2011, it evolved into a larger social movement calling for housing rights for all young people. I supported many of their activities this summer. Um, one of the activities was to study how housing crisis is evolving as a result of climate crisis. Um, I conducted an interview with Jongban and also other flood victims. And we organized a public engagement event. In fact, there were many tragedies in the rain. On the day when it rained, the water came to the house and rose as high as its ceiling in less than 10 minutes. And some people with disabilities were not able to escape and died. So Minister Union and other human rights organizations organized a memorial event for the victims and protested in front of the city hall of Seoul and claiming inequality is the disaster. We also organized many other events. Another example, Jong Gwan Bagai paid 50,000 US dollar as a key deposit to enter the tiny semi basement studio. That's very common in Korea. That's because there is a strange rent system, which is called something. Tenants usually pay 50% to 80% of the property value instead of paying monthly rent. So young people and Jonggan get a bank loan to pay the deposit. The problem is many predatory landlords don't return their deposit in a several legal ways. Um, in 2020 alone, it was reported that 450 billion US dollar was not returned. So Minsner Union organized a um, public discussion event in the National Assembly to address the issue and find a solution. So Minsner Union is the Guru organization for young people who face a variety of housing crises. They address um, discrimination against the LGBTQ youth, um, protect for safe, safe housing for women, eliminate gender-based crimes, and also advocate for the rights of people with disabilities. Let me ask everyone in this room to take a moment to reflect housing from human rights perspective today. The housing crisis in Korea may be different from that in other countries. However, we know that many people suffer from it one way or the other. California, and as, as well as many other states in the US, is facing housing crisis. And in UC campuses, many students find it difficult to pay for the rent. However, some people may think housing is not a human rights issue. It's different from wars, torture, or state violence. I would avoid getting into the debate whether this is human rights issue or not, but I would like to emphasize that when an adequate housing is not protected and provided, other aspects of human rights cannot be protected as well. Our several aspects of our life are connected to housing. And um, with 
climate change, the flooding that worries. In fact, the right to adequate housing is explicitly stated in the UDHR. I'm not sure what the best, best solution is, but a good, start, good place to start is to recognize housing crisis as human rights issue. Throughout my research, I would like to raise the awareness of the problems and protect um, housing rights for all. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, our name is Ajay Shawa. Uh, please let us know if you can hear and see us clearly. Yes, yes. Um, yes. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Excellent. Our name is Ajay Shawa. We used to be pronounced. Um, we are deeply sad that we cannot be there in person, but we wanted to, you know, share in the festivities um, and share our excitement at, at being here. And we would like to talk about um, a little bit about the work that we did this summer. Uh, so we got COVID in the middle of 2020, um, just right after countries were implementing lockdown measures. Uh, it was a mostly mild case, and the doctor who had diagnosed us uh, ensured us that we would be fine after two weeks of quarantine. Um, our initial symptoms did ease after the first uh, two weeks, but we never returned back to the baseline normal that the doctor who diagnosed us um, had assured us. We too did we know that before the COVID virus left, it had left us a present in the form of a degenerative chronic multi-system condition that would have us bed bound um, two, weeks, uh, two years into the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> for more information for people who have been hearing things about long COVID, long haul COVID, but not, you know, not really knowing what, what's going on. Um, at the moment, long haul COVID is currently defined by if one or more symptoms ought to be associated with COVID uh, remains persistent or persists six months after the patient is first diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, and so it's useful to know that Rather than it being like a label for like a specific condition, long COVID is used to describe the cascading effects of COVID um, triggered or related conditions that have not been diagnosed yet. Unfortunately, our case is not unique as 23% um, of COVID patients have recorded long haul symptoms, right? Um, if you need <laughs> any evidence on how different the new post-pandemic normal is for the recently disabled and um, the formerly disabled before the pandemic, I would invite you to look no further than this series of uh, posts that the New York MTA um, pushed within three, two years of each other. So in 2020, uh, New York's MTA released a series of digital ad campaigns meant to help um, public COVID safety protocols. And so you can see how cute it is. I think it was really popular, people taking pictures and even having like heartwarming um, snippets on how this was helping them um, fulfill you know, their civic duties. And so you can see the, the verbiage here is just around the mutual benefits of like masking in public, you know, I take care of you and you take care of me. And then you show like very gentle ways to show why uh, wearing it in these ways are not you know, effective. And then fast forward to 2022, where you start to see this slight change in verbiage where uh, public masking protocols then get you know, absorbed into cultural languages around identity. Um, and so now you see masks are encouraged, but optional, let's respect each other's choices, right? Um, and I, I think it's also useful to bear in mind that in the span of these two years, the only thing that you know, changed was an increased public awareness in just the amount of vaccine resistant strains. Like, so you heard about the, the Delta and the, and the Omicron. Anyways, so I think it's important to set the stage for the global context that shaped our field work. Uh, we're currently in the third year of an ongoing pandemic that has taken millions of lives and disabled a quarter of the people that have been infected. 
regardless of whether or not they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. The government, in collaboration with the CDC, the premier national agency for disease control, has relaxed all public health safety protocols like masking, quarantining, social distancing, um, none of that anymore. Uh, most institutions, including schools, uh, are pushing for uh, an aggressive pre-pandemic normal approach and requiring that people show up in, in person. So in the middle of this, as you know, people who became recently disabled, the question that emerged was, how do disabled people fashion a life when the systems, channels, and the people designed to protect us abandon us and leave us to fend for ourselves? This question culminated into the proposal that we eventually submitted um, that sought to gather testimonials, interviews from people living with disabilities who also held membership within the many numerous slums, Dutch Lagos. Um, Lagos is the commercial capital of Nigeria with over 21 million people. And there were three main reasons why we chose to do this project in Nigeria. I think the first is the fact that after almost nine years of relentless advocacy from national NGOs and also international human rights bodies, um, Nigeria finally signed into law the Disability Human Rights Bill um, in 2019 that stipulated a five-year transitional period um, to modify existing infrastructure, existing buildings, um, and existing automobiles to make them uh, more accessible for people living with disabilities. So, you know, it seemed like a good time three years into this bill um, to ascertain whether there was an awareness of this bill um, on the ground and also if they were on track for this timeline. The second reason we chose Nigeria was because we had established a partnership um, thanks to Maggi. Uh, with the Physically Challenged Empowerment Initiative, PCEI. And PCEI is a local organization um, that is staffed and run by people with even disabilities who are also um, slum dwellers. Uh, the third reason was that we saw a gap in knowledge around disability justice. Um, Nigeria was especially contextually relevant because there were just very few publications emerging from that part of the world that centered disability access and justice. And so with the uh, data collection phase stretching out through the summer, uh, we're currently concluding the thematic analysis piece. We spoke to nine communities, and across the nine communities, several cross-cutting themes emerged. Um, I think four important ones that stand out to us that we'd like to share with the group here is uh, there's just a general low awareness of the and implementation of the bill. Very, very few um, buildings have been modified. There's been a resurgence in state surveillance and violence, particularly for people living with disabilities. Um, there's the constant threat of eviction that these um, slum community members uh, face. And then there's a diversity and an explosion of like informal social relations that we witness. So we'll do like a deeper dive into each of the themes. Okay, so for our first thing, it's useful to note that uh, Lagos State, Lagos State government has not made any meaningful strides towards modifying public buildings, infrastructures, or automobiles like the bill suggested. Um, in fact, quite the contrary, we heard uh, several testimonies from disabled people who you know, showed that they were turned away at several healthcare facilities during the pandemic. Um, and this you know, unsuccessful attempt at disability inclusion is in part you know, due to several factors, you know, amongst which like, there's just a like, general state of dysfunction, right? because the state governments have such a terrible track record in implementing or operationalizing any bill. Um, there is the fact that the Lagos State uh, uh, Office of Disability Affairs, which is the premier uh, office that addresses concerns around disability, 
is very alienated from their demographic base. Um, and this is just due to very unpopular forms of uh, uh, policies that have been implemented. And I think the last part reason is the, the notable uh, NGO disability organizations are also deeply unpopular with the poorer urban disabled residents. Um, and this is due to established patterns of just class-based discrimination and anti-poor advocacy. The second theme that we have is a resurgence in state violence and surveillance. Um, we're sure that most people who are you know, in this room today have probably heard about the uh, NSAS protests that um, blossomed in Nigeria uh, in 2020. And so a lot of people know about the type of state sanctioned violence um, that the bigger state meted out on its uh, citizens. What you know, people don't know is that this tragic and public incident is, was just really the inevitable conclusion of the types of coercive violence that the state had been implementing on you know, the various sub-marginalized uh, populations. So in 2016, we believe, um, just a couple years before the Discrimination Against People with Disabilities Act was passed, uh, the State had passed a street trading and illegal prohibition law, effectively criminalizing uh, alternative income streams like uh, arms begging, hawking, um, crowdfunding, right? And these are frequently the only forms of economic activities that you know disabled people are able to participate in. This law was repealed in 2017, but this law still emboldens uh, the Lagos State Rescue Task Force to basically uh, do sweeps, public sweeps of disabled people that they find um, in public. And they extort them for money um, or threaten them with, um, the, like they will be cutted to a detention center in Manchester, which is basically a glorified prison. And most people who go there do not come out. Um, the third uh, theme that I read was just the threat of eviction through violent sweeps. So, in a state of 21 million, uh, I think the official number is uh, three-fourths of the residents currently live in slums or informal settlements. It's really, really alarming that the mega states uh, approach to this startling number of people living in informal settlements has been either disregard or just state sanctioned violence, right? Most of the community members that we interviewed shared that their slum communities um, were under near constant threat of eviction, and it was so constant that most of like the um, the instruments that they used to build their houses, like zinc and wood, are used precisely because it helps them create impermanent structures, um, such that they're not creating permanent structures that the state ends up coming to bulldoze um, or waste. This is just how alarming. Um, this very violent and brute uh, use of state force is. And so I think it's really interesting when you see this type of, not just structural forms of you know, inaccessibility, but you actually see a deliberate attempt by the state to end you know, the lives of uh, urban poor disabled people. So I guess, you know, in order to also share some of like the stories of resistance and agency, we also noticed that in the, you know, in the light of the fact that there are no uh, structural forms of accessibility, uh, these disabled communities frequently have to create their own social fiber of accessibility. Um, so there was evidences of like tight knit saving collectives, informal cross border tracking systems, housing pods, um, culturally derived social hierarchies. I think in, in spite of like these intense forms of repression, we see um, times of agency. Um, so we would like to, I think, round off this presentation by inviting everyone with us to you know, sit and imagine if, you know, in 50 years time, if someone asked us to tell the story 
of the COVID pandemic, how would we tell it, who would we center, who would live to tell the story. We hope that our story, you know, this time around is a story of true collective care that prioritizes um, people with learning disabilities. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Malaka Fena and I'm a 2L at Berkeley Law. Um, as a proud daughter of Palestinian immigrants, I had the privilege to be able to return to my homeland this summer and work with the International Legal Foundation, a legal organization that provides legal aid in a holistic, trauma-informed manner for low-income communities. In Palestine and the West Bank, approximately 45% of the population are people between the ages of 12 and 18. The reason I emphasize the West Bank is because Palestine is victim to an apartheid regime. If you're born in the West Bank on one side of a wall, you are um, dealt with through the Palestine Authority. On the other side of the wall, you are subject to Israeli mil military law. So it's two different legal systems. For youth and for juvenile justice in particular, um, I'm going to be focusing on kids born in the West Bank, kids who face the risk of being detained by Palestinian authority-run prisons. Despite having such a significant young population, there's only one detention center in all of the West Bank, and called Dar al-Amal, the House of Hope, ironically, in Ramallah. And this is a significant problem, because 25% of juvenile cases, most of the juveniles end up going to detention, 25% of them. So this leads to a significant problem where juveniles are often placed with adults in adult prisons. And this can lead to violence, to sexual abuse, um, to harassment, and many other human rights violations. In fact, according to a report by the International Legal Foundation in 2011, um, 1,702 juveniles were accused of a criminal offense. 284 days passed between arrests and between the judgment. This leads to a lot of youth being placed in pretrial detention, unable to talk to their families, unable to continue their education, and oftentimes, because of um, being low income or financial situations, being unable to talk to counsel and their lawyer. 16% of juveniles were informed of their right to counsel by the prosecutor at the time of investigation. This number is you know, obviously ridiculously low. For youth who are being arrested, they're not informed of their rights. So they're there oftentimes being faced and forced to succumb to pressure by the prosecutor, who can often use tactics for investigation that can kind of take the form of bullying and harassment. 43%, less than half, were told of their reason for arrest. 74% of the youth reported suffering from some form of abuse, whether physical or psychological. And so I kind of just want you to, oh, sorry. Oops. Here, I got you. Okay, thank you. I hate to call you. Um, <laughs> but I just kind of want you to take yourself, take a moment just to picture yourself in these kids' shoes terrified, scared, unaware of being of why you're being held. Take into a place where you're unable to see your family, where you don't have a lawyer present to advocate for you, facing the pressure of succumbing to law enforcement and prosecutors' questions that are often done in a menacing and in an angry manner. A lot of times people are unaware of the science of youth brain development, how oftentimes parts of our brains and our understanding and our capacity for emotional reasoning is not fully developed, especially when you're still a teenager. And so it's obvious from these statistics that a more holistic, trauma-informed approach is needed to ensure that alternatives to prison are provided. And that's where my work with the ILF came in. Is there a possibility to go back? Yeah. Okay. So um, when? The juvenile protection law? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, the International Legal Foundation, along with other government bodies and legal orgs in the West Bank, were able to help draft the Juvenile Protection Law of 2016, which established significant reforms that prioritize rehabilitation over punitive measures when interacting with youth. 
The law created a number of reforms, including creating a separate juvenile court in Palestine with specialized juvenile defense attorneys, prohibited juveniles from being charged with the death penalty or economic fines, emphasized rehabilitation and mediation through offering a means of community service and educational programs for youth, and developed the position of the Child Protection Guide, a child advocate that functions as a role of a social worker, trained to work with the child and their needs, as well as establishing investigations that, and establish that investigations may not occur without the presence of the lawyer, the child's advocate, and the child protection guide, and the child's parent and guardian. These are obviously a few steps that have taken things in the right direction. However, as someone who identifies as an abolitionist, this is only the first step of a long journey. In fact, the ILF this summer, I was working with them to establish what are the recommendations to enhance the future of juvenile justice. A lot of times, as we see in the US, the law will tell us one thing and an application will look completely different. And so these are some of the recommendations I found through my investigation and through my research. Developing a clear channel for juveniles to report instances of physical and mental abuse that occur within the justice system. Children should be able to advocate for themselves. Releasing juveniles and dismissing charges against them whenever there are unnecessary delays in bringing them to trial. Developing a diversion system at the police station with representatives that provide alternatives to entry into the justice system, like participating in community service and providing youth with access to mental health resources and treatment. We've all heard the saying that it takes a village to raise a child, and juvenile defense is no different. Having and providing a youth with a criminal defense attorney is not enough. We need to be providing them with trained community organizers, parent advocates, team administrators, and mental health experts. This network can be a driving factor in saving a kid's life and allowing them to continue with their education. Take the example of Ahmed here, a client of the ILF. Ahmed was a 15-year-old boy who was facing 15 years of imprisonment for murder. Ahmed one day was playing around with his friends and he carried a pocket knife for protection. He was poking around, he thought he poked his friend with the closed handle of the knife, only to find out that he had actually stabbed his friend. Facing 15 years meant he would leave the system when he was 30, missing a key part of his life. Through the ILF's help, he was able to have the charges and the time reduced to three years, not in a detention center, but in a rehabilitation center, where he was able to still stay with his family, but conduct community service-oriented programs and continue his access to education. Today, not only is Ahmed free and within his community, but he is also a trainer that teaches children horseback riding and how to overcome their fears. Every child should receive the report that Ahmed received. Together, we can foster a world where our youth feel heard, respected, and empowered. Thank you. Uh, this one is for you, Malak. Um, a lot of what you talked about with youth in Palestine sounded very familiar, very similar to some of the things that youth here in the United States go through, especially youth uh, in under-resourced communities like in Oakland, where I live. Uh, and I wondered, if you had any novel or interesting takeaways or lessons learned working over there that you think are relevant to, to youth in this country? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I'm actually, I'm from Chicago as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very familiar to Please. seeing the way that um, youth are often, especially black and brown youth, are often at risk of entering the school to prison pipeline. My high school, I went to high school of 4,000 kids. We had police officers stationed at every corner. I was used to seeing people slammed up against lockers, having lockers searched. Um, and so I think what I noticed is that in Palestine, the minimum age of entering the system is 12, which is still, in my opinion, ridiculous. But when you look at the US, a lot of states don't even have a minimum age in which a youth can enter the juvenile system. 
California, it's the age of 12. But in Chicago or in Illinois, where I'm from, there is no minimum age. You could be three years old entering the system. In fact, it has happened. A five-year-old recently was taken and arrested for having a tantrum in her kindergarten class. You know, so this goes to show how much more we need to go with our youth. We need to have advocates that are able to understand brain development, understand positive youth development, and see why are we criminalizing and targeting our youth who are just kids that are allowed to have healthy emotional responses. Um, how can we make sure that we are engaging with the community and stepping forward to abolish police, abolish prisons, abolish things like that, especially within our school systems. So I think being over there, I really saw how um, we really need to do a lot more, especially when it comes to raising the age in which a youth can enter the system, but making sure that with this new law, the emphasis was, how do we make sure our youth never enter the systems? How do we make sure that they are only experiencing rehabilitation and the mental health support that they need? And I think that's something I'm hoping, you know, um, we'll continue to see in the US. Thank you so much for your presentation. My question is for Anshu. Um, what would, what has the Korean government or other accountable agencies in Korea done to ensure that people don't face housing crisis, and what are these been doing to support organizations like the one like you work with this summer to ensure support to address this issue? I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat your question again? Okay. Yeah, sure. I was wondering if you could comment on what the Korean government has done to support the organization in general uh, about the housing crisis issues that people are facing in Korea. In general? In general. Yes. Okay, so your question is how or what the Korean government is doing to support such um, civil society organization. Um, yes, there, the government, well, it's complicated. <laughs> um, the Minsne Union, the, the originally student union, um, became civil society organization supported by Seoul City. Um, but at that time, the mayor was from the Liberal Party, and he was also from civil society organization. He was the leader of the civil society organization. But after he stepped down, um, Korea experienced kind of rise of the, um, well, it's my opinion, <laughs> far right. Um, it's a global trend. So many young people and young men support conservative candidates who promote very extreme ideas like anti-feminism, um, anti-liberalism. So two years ago, the mayor of Seoul um, changed and then he stopped funding civil society organization. So it depends on the party and the political situation. So 10 years ago, when they started, they got a lot of support from the government and the city, but now, they, all of their fundings are cut. So, yeah, that's why it's complicated, yeah. Hello, I want to thank the panelists for the presentation. My question is for Violet. Violet, you talked about extractivism, I guess, policy with the academic research. Can you go more into that, how the digital archives is different? Yes, um, thank you for the question. So you said extractivism, yes. that was the question, okay. Thank you. Um, as you remember, the title of our presentation is um, Precarity and Possibility Under Neoliberalism, right? And um, extractivism in academia, especially in and for indigenous communities has to do with, has to do with um, basically researchers coming to El Salvador and researching indigenous communities, but by the time they leave and take the knowledges from indigenous communities, they tend to anonymize the research, meaning that they don't give credit, they don't even name the producers of knowledge, right? And that takes the dignity, the humanity of people who are sharing these knowledges. 
oftentimes they are not getting an opportunity to review and read what is being published so that sometimes mistakes go out as produced. Um, and most importantly, they suffer from research fatigue, right? They are tired of people coming in, taking the knowledges and leaving, and maybe saying thank you and never coming back. And so what indigenous communities have done in this summer, um, and they allow me to be part of that, is, is to create a living history archive for the first time where they are telling their own story in their own words and there's no interference from the West. No one is extracting. The research is there for them and for the communities, for diaspora, who want to access those knowledges, those histories, those stories that oftentimes are not theirs to tell even though it's their stories, right? So the project, thanks to the generosity of the Human Rights Center at Berkeley, allows for indigenous community to create the space for them to be their own storytellers and to have access to their own knowledge production to restore um, intellectual sovereignty, right? Which is a human right that they have been denied for always. So, thank you. Adesia, what did you want to speak? No? Okay. <laughs> More questions? Yes, come to you. Uh, this is for Violet. Osio, Alani Ansalki, the Wild Money Porter. Um, my name is Armani Porter, and I'm Eastern Bank Cherokee. Uh, I do work down in El Salvador, excuse me. <laughs> I do work down in El Salvador, and uh, during my time down there, I would ask people, where are the indigenous people? And they say, oh yeah, we kill all of them. And I asked them, where are all the black people? And they say, oh yeah, we kill all of them too. And uh, really just from your, from your perspective, I'm curious to know, to what degree do you see these two, uh, these two struggles as connected? And in a certain way, do you see uh, anti-indigeneity as firmly embedded within anti-blackness? Lastly, um, are there any um, institutions or, or, or movements that are, are equal Okay, within the black community uh, relative to what you're working on. Thank you for your question. I think uh, that's a beautiful question, right? Um, we have a long history of denials of existence of indigenous peoples in El Salvador. Thank you. Um, and so it starts with colonization, with imperialism, and it continues with war that never ends. And so indigenous peoples in El Salvador have endured many, many massacres. Um, for years, right? We survived pandemics in the past and dispossession of the land, dispossession of our identities. And so there is a strong movement of killing the Indian, saving the man, similarly to what is happening in this country. We, our country, El Salvador is a huge cemetery of indigenous peoples, right? But Tata Fidel, who is the person that I work with this summer, always says, you know, they tried to cut the branches of a tree, but they left the roots, and so we sprout. And we are proud to say that diaspora and young people are awakening and reclaiming the roots, learning the languages, demanding justice. But we have had so many struggles um, that it's been so difficult. And I agree 100% with what you say that black and indigenous movements are tied together and connected as much as their struggles for survivance, right? Their massacre, genocide, it's there in our histories. In El Salvador specifically, we have been sold the history of mestizaje or blanqueamiento where everybody says we're half and half, we're Spaniards, there's no black people here, there's no indigenous, they, they all die. That's what you hear people say. But you know, thanks to people like Tata Fidel, Tata Nicolás, Tata Noemi, uh, that the Daniel, I'm here to say, you know, we're here to stay, and we're reclaiming our land, we're reclaiming our knowledges, our cultures, our traditions, and we're reclaiming our our mother tongue. And I think it, diaspora is key. With 25% of the country traveling, being forced to migrate during the war in the 1980s, this is the first probably first, second generation Salvadorans who are being born in the U.S. who are now in college demanding their, their histories, demanding to know what happened. And this generation is going to be critical to reviving the movement and, and bringing justice to people, right? And I know I'm looking someone in the back who is part of this movement, part of wanting to 
fight back and you know just survive basically but I, I appreciate your question I think is very much a, a united movement across across the globe right um, goes suit to suit right we are united together and, and we fight together for survivance and to uplift voices that are indigenized and decolonizing every day thank you We've just got time for just one more question or two. If anyone has a question for Adishiwa, yes. Uh, thank you so much. I had two quick questions. One was uh, you referenced that the some of the housing was created with wood and zinc, and I was wondering if those in, was that was intentional to create structures that didn't have permanence. And then the other question was regarding the summary. Um, where it said that uh, facilitating rethinking of ableist beliefs by non-disabled people, and I wanted elaboration on that, if you could help. Thank you. Did that all come through, Adeshewa? Yes, yes, they did. Um, so the first question is around the use of impermanent materials to build housing, right? Did we get yes. that correctly? And the second one is around um, having this project be a type of logic pad to uh, establish conversations around what it actually means to be in solidarity with disabled people. Is this correct? Did we get you? Yes, correct? yes. Okay. So, you know, the first one, yes, it is an intentional choice, even as much as it is a choice also based on uh, necessity. So, I think. In a lot of existing slum research, there's frequently a type of shame around the impermanence of slum housing. So it's usually frequently extracted or theorized or used in conversations with us around that this is like a, a metric to show vulnerability. But it, it was important for us to highlight this because we could see ways that the use of impermanence is also a way to resist or limit the shocks of like the state, right? Um, these are people who have had to be on the run. And the, the their captor is the state, which is really terrible. Um, but what this means is that insofar as they cannot escape the tentacles of the state, what they need to do is that they need to be able to think about what it means to get housing, right, under the persistent peril of eviction. That is the friction that they are trying to navigate. And for them, the use of like this very cheap, uh, accessible forms of materials is a way for them to have temporary homes whilst they realizing that they're always on the run, right? Um, it's, it's in itself like a dance of precarity and possibility, like in, in full view. Um, so what we wanted to do was to rethink and like allow people to rethink what impermanence can be used as and what it can be used for beyond just as a site of vulnerability. Um, we hope this helps uh, answer the question. So we do believe it's, it's as much as a ne necessary material choice as it is an intentional choice of um, survival. Uh, the second question around helping people access in this release. So going into this project, you know, one thing that we knew, and this is just by us being also disabled, um, is that in as much as we talk about structural accessibility, the forms of exclusion or social exclusion that disabled people frequently face um, is not possible without um, the complicity of uh, able-bodied people. Right? So able-bodied people are not just bystanders in this, they're active um, parties in the acts of exclusion that disabled people experience. So part of the goal for this project was to begin to form the language for what does it mean to agitate for your right to be here, to use human rights language, but more for what does it mean to constantly chafe against people who, by virtue of you know, their own internalized in disbelief, are willing to turn a blind eye to the types of violent acts that the state commits, right? And so having the uh, community members even share stories of them pushing back 
and friction against their non-disabled uh, community members was useful for us because we wanted to see ways that these types of dialogue, frictions, and conflicts um, play out. And hoping that you know people truly see just how porous the category of being disabled is, and that they know that you know fighting for disabled people is not a type of action that takes away from their benefits, right? But it's a way for them to live despite the terror of the Nigerian state. And so, you know, being in solidarity with disabled people is more to their benefit. And if they can go beyond like the very obvious um, forms of gratification they feel um, for exerting their power over disabled people, uh, they would be able to emerge much more generative forms of uh, resistance and solidarity. We hope that answers the question. Do you feel like the pandemic in particular created a specific um, opportunity for state forces to um, be more harsh on disabled persons in a way that they would not have done previously? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, at the risk of sounding blasphemous, uh, we will see you here. But perhaps not in the way that people would expect. So in general, you know, there's very little that the state does to disabled people that they are not able to do at the moment, right? Um, what we think, though, the pandemic has done is that the pandemic has led to a resurgence in very alarming form of eugenicist rhetoric, right? Um, and so we think about the types of languages around who, who becomes disposable in pandemics. What it does, though, is what, what the state does in the shadows is able to bring it now to the forefront and then get our, you know, the able-bodied or non-disabled society's collective consensus, right? Um, and so when I think about the types of, and we are going to put this in the U.S. because, you know, we're all sitting here at this point you know, in time. The types of rhetoric, the types of strategies, the types of policies that the state has put into motion throughout the past three years, not only, you know, has rendered uh, disabled people, people who were disabled prior to the pandemic even more vulnerable, right? It has allowed them to create a whole new reason for why a significant population of the people of the population can be disposed, right? Mm -hmm. um, so Yes, in that way, but not in the sense that it's generating new animals, it's just creating the consensus. And we see that this is a tactic that states, nation states employ frequently, you know, in the afterlife of pandemics. So it's interesting to see how this plays out almost cyclically and how very few of us that are not disabled are able to see this larger picture. And this is how the state continues to retain its power over, over uh, who gets to live and die? One more over here. Hi, so this question is for Violet. Um, Violet was the first um, Salvadorian woman I have met that actually holds a doctorate um, and is pursuing her doctorate. So she is a trailblazer for all Salvadorian women. So thank you, Violet. <laughs> Very briefly, um, I just wanted to ask, how has your work um, impacted your identity and that of your children and your grandbaby now? Thank you. Um, that's, that's a really powerful question. Um, you know, I am an immigrant, um, basically a refugee of war that came here in the 1980s. Um, and at the time, the U.S. had very hostile and continues to have very hostile immigration policies, especially for the global south. Um, and I've always, my dad retired from UC Berkeley while he was dying in his bed. He was a custodian. He used to clean the hallways at UC Berkeley. And I used to walk around the campus thinking, what would it be like? to be a student at UC. So this one's for you, Dad, because I never thought I could be here today, but I never lost hope. Um, 
researching has opened many doors and this fellowship for sure opened great doors for me and for my communities in El Salvador. And I think the more we learn about where we come from, from our roots, the more we know who we are, what we've lost, the fact that I'm having to learn Nahua at my age brings a lot of pain to my heart because I should have been born speaking it. If I am half and half, I should have been speaking both languages, but I don't. I'm learning that. And when my grandchild was born this week, he was born on Indigenous People's Day, and he was blessed by the communities in El Salvador. They gave him a community, a place to bury his umbilicus, a place to go back, a return. And I think that as I see him every day, I always make a point to say one or two things, and now what? You need to learn that it's your root, it's where you come from. And I think it's, it's powerful for all of us to think about where we come from, our struggles, what we lost um, in the fight for existence, and to be grateful for the opportunities we have as much as always looking forward, stepping with our, you know, eyes in the past, never, never forget what has happened so that it doesn't happen again. So we don't let it happen again. So thank you for, for your question. And I have a lot of hope in the youth and diaspora because I think all of you are going to change everything as we know it. A lot of us, my generation, are so deeply traumatized by war and by civil right violations, human right violations, that sometimes we we are afraid, we're still afraid, but I think the young people have the future in their hands, and, and as you say, you know, we need to open doors for them because they, they can change things. Thank you. I would like to introduce the third and final panel of the afternoon. This panel is titled Structural Exclusion and Institutionalization of the U.S.'s Marginalized Communities. We will be hearing from Carolyn Lester, who is a second year law student here at Berkeley Law, Rhea Desai from the Joint Medical Program, uh, so getting a master's from the School of Public Health, and also an MD from the UCSF School of Medicine, Francis Santos, who's a third year law student at Berkeley Law, and also he is this year's International Human Rights Law Clinic Fellow. And finally, Anna Judson, who joined us last year as an undergraduate, and now is a first year law student here at Berkeley Law. So with that, please welcome our panelists. Thanks a lot, please. I think that's great. Um, I'm Caroline, I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you so much. Um, so um, once the slideshow appears, you'll see that it's the Texas seal that is, I think, the official Texas Justice Department seal. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about the death penalty in Texas. So I'm going to tell you about its history and how it works. Um, and by the end of it, I hopefully will have explained why the system we have today is fundamentally unjust. So this is a photo of the Tom Green County Courthouse. It's uh, very pretty, very regal. Um, as a legal intern for the Regional Public Defender's Office, um, which is a public defense uh, office that specializes in rural death penalty cases, I thought I would be spending all of my time there. But in reality, I spent all my time at the Tom Green County Jail, which as you can see is aesthetically very different. Um, so I worked on with three clients, um, and it's sort of they span the gamut of all the different possibilities in capital cases. Um, one was white, one was Latino, and one was black. Um, one had a good self-defense case. One had a lot of evidence stacked against him, and one I believe was 100% innocent. Um, all of my clients were indigent, which means that they can't afford their own lawyer. That's common among 100% of the people on federal death row and 90-something percent of people on state death row. And in my position, I work with three areas of the office, mitigators, investigators, and lawyers. And the first step to understanding the issues that I'm going to talk about today 
is uh, lies with understanding the mitigator's role. So these people tend to be trained social workers, and their job is to learn as much about the client as possible, um, about their life and what led them to where they are today. And these mitigators help the lawyers begin to build a story. And that story is central to how the death penalty works and why it is such a biased and discriminatory system. So the death penalty has always been a part of the US criminal system, but it was briefly outlawed for four years in the 1970s. Um, until then, death penalty, the death penalty was used as a means of racial control, and the vast majority of people executed were black. So in 1972, the Supreme Court held that, quote, these sentences are cruel and unusual in the same way that being struck by lightning is cruel and unusual. It's rare, it's random, and it's devastating. The Supreme Court ruled narrowly. Uh, they held that capital punishment itself was not unconstitutional. It was simply applied unconstitutionally. So it was totally arbitrary as to who was executed, and that made it so there could be a very subtle form of discrimination with horrific consequences. In response to that narrow ruling, states enacted a flurry of laws to address the uneven applications, and within four years, the death penalty was reinstated. Now 24 states have the death penalty, and Texas has carried out more executions than any other state in this new era. In this new system, bias is still a huge issue, but in a very different way. The biggest racial factor in determining whether someone gets a death penalty is based on the race of the victim. So murdering white people makes you far more likely to be executed. Uh, this is a painting of a jury from, I think, 1806. Uh, we would like to think that jury makeup has changed, but not always. Um, so there are two parts to a death penalty trial, uh, the guilt and innocence phase, and then if they are determined to be guilty, um, the jury then decides between life without parole or execution. This is called the sentencing phase, and this is where mitigators come in. And their job is to tell you the client's life story. The prosecution is also allowed to tell the defendant's life story. And in this phase, everything is on the table, regardless of its connection to the crime. So we have cases where elementary school teachers are testifying to the personality of a 40-year-old person, and where jail guards are given equal weight as psycho uh, psychologists. And this whole process is stacked against the defense in a number of ways. You have the same jury on both parts of the case, of the trial. Um, you cannot tell them that it is um, a decision to execute somebody must be unanimous. One holdout is enough to sentence to a death, sentence the defendant to life without parole. And all jurors have to be death qualified, which means that they have to um, fundamentally agree with the death penalty in order to serve on one of these uh, panels. So this new version of the death penalty is not arbitrary in the sense that there are no standards. It's arbitrary in the sense that standards are not predictable. The jurors enter the trials with their own sets of morals and convictions, and in the end, the best lawyers are storytellers. And juries, especially juries in sentencing hearings, are convinced by the best narrative. That might explain why the condemned are disproportionately black and almost always poor, and it might also explain why white victims are disproportionately represented on death row. In trials, victim impact statements always come last. So, I'm missing a slide, but I'm just going to keep going. Uh, I've told you about the history of the death penalty, and I've explained why, despite the Supreme Court, the death penalty remains um, arbitrary. And now I'm going to focus on the last part, which is narrative and storytelling. I think, so, um, is it this slide you're looking for? Yes. Thank you. Um, this is a beautiful rural Texas. Um, I can't legally tell you the details of my clients' cases, but I can tell you about the people I met while working on them. Um, so this was for a client who I'm just going to call Dwayne. And to pre prepare for Dwayne's trial, we set up a kind of mock jury, where we got about a dozen people to come and listen to what we would present during the sentencing hearing. And these people were from very rural Texas. They really believed in the death penalty. And when we told them what our client was accused of doing, they were all very down for an execution. Uh, but that changed, and I was really surprised by what changed it. So when we presented our mitigation defense, our sentencing hearing, um, we explained how our client had a really tough life. His father was extremely physically abusive and very psychically unwell. He would dress his son, sons in toe sacks when they went to school and when they were nine and seven. 
He gave them a shotgun and kicked them out of the house for two weeks, telling them that they had to learn how to survive on their own. Our client was also a very kind man who did a horrible thing, and we told the jury how his kindness manifested. Uh, when he was little, he would protect his mom from his dad's assaults, and in jail, he used whatever money he had in his commissary account to make sure that everyone else at the jail had enough to eat. But none of this really seemed to have an effect on our mock jury. And then we decided to tell the puppy story. When Dwayne was eight years old, his uncle gave him a litter of puppies and told him to kill them because the men in their family had to learn to be tough. And that was a story that created an audible gasp from the audience who had not reacted once when we walked through this really intense personal history. So after that experience, I talked to all of the sample jurors and uh, I talked to the one couple who had changed their mind out of these 12 people. And they told me that their best friend's nephew had been executed a, two, executed a few years ago, which statistically is pretty wild, that executions are very rare. Um, and it's very rare to run into people who have a personal experience with them. And they also told me that despite knowing that man and his family, they supported the execution because they thought he deserved it. And then they told me that they felt very differently about Dwayne. They said the thing that convinced them was a puppy story, and they felt, and I'm quoting them, that he didn't have a chance. So one part of me was like, great, we have a fact, a detail, and a story that might save Dwayne's life. And the second part of me was so disturbed, this man's life came down to a chance telling of one thing that resonated with one or two people who would vote against an execution. We almost didn't throw it in because we were worried that it would make our client less sympathetic. So I want to ask, is that really justice? Death penalty lawyers, prosecutors, and defenders are storytellers. <clears throat> We're telling a story about good versus evil, about redemption versus extreme punishment. And if one person's life depends entirely on telling a good story, I think we have a problem. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ria, and for my fellowship, I work with Families for Justice Reform Fan on Compassionate Releases in California. To understand the grave importance of compassionate release, I want to start with a video of Ms. Rhonda Felix sharing her experience. My son, he was in prison for about six and a half years, I got a call from the doctor at the hospital. He asked when we found out that he had stage four cancer. When it was already too late. I started doing my research. Signed the paper when he was out to get the process started because it takes six months to get approved. We don't want nothing else just to get him home. Rhonda and her family immediately applied for Damari's compassionate release. Months later, he passed away in prison, still waiting for his application to be processed. Compassionate release failed their family, and it was designed to fail. Today, I hope to share how it failed and what can be done to prevent these traumatic experiences of family separation at the end of life. Can you talk a little closer to the mic? Yes, thank you. First, uh, what is Compassionate Release? Compassionate Release is a program that provides early release for terminally ill, very sick, or incapacitated people. And each state has their own uh, program. In California, the mechanism was first utilized in the 1990s in a period of growing mass incarceration and widespread illness and death during the HIV AIDS epidemic, incarcerated women with HIV in California and their advocates led a near impossible fight for decarceration. In 1997, they codified compassionate release into California law. And while this program has expanded over the years, it has been greatly underutilized. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, at least 17,000 individuals incarcerated in California were medically high risk. But data, data on compassionate release between January 2015 and April 2021 showed that only 329 applications were started for 304 applicants. And only 53 people were released in time to pass away with loved ones on the outside. An outcome that was two times more likely than release was death. 91 people passed away before the process was completed. Why did so few get out? The process for compassionate release is long and has many steps to determine medical eligibility and risk to public safety. This diagram outlines the process, and while the specific steps are difficult to understand in the time we have, 
what's clear is that compassionate release is an incredibly complicated process for anyone, and especially for people at the end of their life. And getting past each step requires an extraordinary amount of advocacy, which means that release is the exception and not the rule. And let's talk about some reasons why. First, the prison healthcare system is not set up to provide good care. An advocate we spoke with said there are broader barriers around neglectful health care inside. People don't know what their diagnoses are until it gets closer to the end. Within the prison health care system is a total setup for people to not be able to access relief. In addition to delayed diagnoses, physicians act as gatekeepers to the process. While there are cases of exceptional doctors who will put in the extra effort to advocate for their patients' compassionate release, a CDCR doctor we spoke with said, some physicians are wary of making that prognosis. There's a reluctance for the prison doctors to get involved. And even if people's application was started, 15% of applications did not move forward because people did not have a place to go if they were released. A CDCR social worker shared that at the institutions where there aren't medical social workers, unless there's family or friends, there's no way they will apply for compassionate release. For applications that were medically eligible and have a place to be released to, the application then goes to the secretary of CDCR. The secretary rejected 25% of all applications that reached their desk with complete discretion in decision making. And for the next step in the process, an attorney shared that there's no real standard of proof that the court must find beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is a public safety risk. It is so broad that they can rely on anything they want. While some are released through the work of exceptional advocacy, compassionate release is a structurally impossible pathway to freedom for disabled and terminally ill people. A coalition that I'm a part of, led by women impacted by the criminal legal system, worked to change that. Just two weeks ago, the governor signed our bill, AB 960, successfully expanding compassionate release in California in several ways. AB 960 expands eligibility to people with serious and advanced illness with the end of life trajectory and removes the criteria that people require 24 hours of care. With AB 960, the secretary was also removed from the process so that after medical eligibility is determined, people's applications will go straight to the, straight to the sentencing court. This is an important step forward and still there are many barriers that remain unaddressed. This video by Forward This Production tells the story of someone currently caught up in those barriers. The most curious thing in your life is fighting for your hair. I didn't think I was going to make it. My oxygen level was 73. But then when he hit me with the heavy pit, I knew it was serious. And then uh, Gary Cooper, age 73, been down for 20 years. I'm a veteran, served in Vietnam from 66 to 68. Uh, my face was so swollen, you know, they didn't recognize me. I've been hospitalized three times because of leukemia. My doctor wanted to give me compassionate release because of the fact that all my health issues, and I had heart disease, leukemia, neuropathy, I've had 12 surgeries for basal cells, you know, that's three cancerous, you know, skin graft for one of them. So what I've been going through medically is unbelievable. You know, I don't know what's going to happen next. You're not going to believe Mr. Gary Cooper did not meet medical eligibility for compassionate release and remains incarcerated. While we hope that the changes made through AB 960 would allow more people like Mr. Cooper to have a chance at release, ultimately, compassionate release is a political decision and public support for releasing incarcerated elders is critical. Through your votes, advocacy, and support for the organizations that helped pass AB 960, like CCWP, Uncommon Law, Root and Rebound, and FAM. I hope that you'll join movements demanding that people be free. Hello everyone. My name is Francis Santos. I'm a third year law student here in Berkeley. And this past summer, I did work for the ACLU's Racial Justice Program. And today I'm going to present one of the projects that I did, which concerned challenging occupational licensing regulations as a barrier to economic freedom for the formerly incarcerated. 
Every summer in California, approximately 4,000 state prison inmates serve as volunteer firefighters. They put themselves at tremendous risk, putting out thousands of wildfires with very little pay. But what's even more unfortunate is that when some of them decide to leave prison and decide to pursue a career in firefighting because of the experience that they've gained serving as volunteer fighters, they face enormous barriers because several regulations prevent them, on account of their criminal history, from receiving the certifications necessary to become licensed as full-time firefighters. This problem isn't limited to the state of California or to the occupation of firefighting. All across the country, approximately 1,800 occupational licensing boards regulate hundreds of occupations, ranging from activities such as working as an EMT or working as a midwife, to other activities like shampooing someone's hair or doing someone's nails. As of 2016, the American Bar Association found that over 27,000 state licensing uh, regulations restrict access to licenses for anyone with a criminal history. Economic freedom means freedom, especially for the formerly incarcerated who are doing their very best to make a living and who are doing their best to escape the cycle of crime and poverty that has trapped them for so long. These occupational licensing regulations are a substantial barrier to achieving that economic freedom, and for that reason, they should be challenged. And that's precisely the type of work that I did with the ACLU this past summer. One of the main projects that I did was developing a legal strategy to challenge occupational licensing regulations that prevent the formerly incarcerated from gaining access to occupational licenses. And one of the main claims that I was focused on developing was this argument that these licensing regulations violate the US Constitution under the 14th Amendment. Now, I obviously won't go too much into the details of constitutional law doctrine, but the most important thing to know is that when courts evaluate the constitutionality of any law under the 14th Amendment, it can do so under one out of three standards of constitutional scrutiny. The first standard is that of strict scrutiny. This standard applies when the law affects a fundamental right or if it discriminates against a suspect class like race or national origin. And under this standard, the court presumes that the law is unconstitutional unless the government can show that it is necessary to achieve a compelling government purpose. On the other side of the spectrum is rational basis scrutiny. This is the opposite of strict scrutiny because it applies when the law does not concern a fundamental right or concerns a suspect classification. And under this standard, the court assumes that the law is constitutional as long as the government can show that it is rationally related to a legitimate government purpose. And the third standard is intermediate scrutiny or what is sometimes called heightened rational basis review. And this just operates in the middle of these two standards. Now when courts evaluate economic laws like licensing regulations, they usually apply a rational basis scrutiny. Be and, and, and this is problematic because the standard pretty much operates most of the time like a rubber stamp that approves the challenge law and accepts most of the government's stated justifications for it. Because of that, much of the work that I did for this project involved reviewing case law and finding ways to argue that a higher standard of scrutiny like intermediate scrutiny or heightened rational basis should apply for these licensing regulations that target the formerly incarcerated. And that's what I managed to do by the end of my summer with the ACLU. I helped develop four legal arguments that would help inform their litigation strategy as in a way to argue for a higher standard of scrutiny for these types of regulations. The first argument that I had was that having a criminal background or history is a permanent fixed distinction that marks the formerly incarcerated for life. And higher constitutional scrutiny should apply for laws that discriminate against people based on characteristics that are pretty much impossible for them to change on their, on their own. The second argument is that the 14th Amendment protects freedoms that are essential for achieving individual dignity and autonomy. And for the formerly incarcerated especially, obtaining an occupation allows them to become self-sufficient, to regain respect, and to ultimately thrive in the communities that they return to. The third argument is that laws that reflect and enforce personal private biases do not even pass the low standard of rational basis scrutiny. And very often, most of these 
licensing regulations reflect these personal biases against the formerly incarcerated. These regulations are often based on unfounded assumptions that everyone who has a criminal history is immoral, that they're lazy, that they have alcohol or drug abuse problems, or that they're always a danger to society. The fourth argument and final argument is that disenfranchisement laws are laws that prevent the formerly incarcerated from voting and underrepresentation in state legislatures make the formerly incarcerated a politically powerless group. And heightened constitutional protection should be given to groups that cannot effectively promote their own interests or rights through the political process. Those are most of the arguments that I helped develop for, for that, to help the ACLU team working on bringing litigation on this issue um, for, for creating a, an argumented strategy, regardless of the type of regulation or specific occupation that they will challenge in court in the future. Now, I just want to end my presentation real quick by, by saying that if we want to imagine a world without prison, where people are free and where communities are actually thriving, a very crucial part of like achieving or imagining that vision it requires us to imagine the formerly incarcerated serving as our firefighters, as our hairdressers, as our bus drivers, as our bartenders, our fishermen, as our physical trainers, and of them working a whole variety of other occupations within our communities. The formerly incarcerated are doing their very best to make, to have, and make an honest living for themselves and to escape cycles of recidivism that have kept, kept them trapped for so long. But these occupational licensing regulations prevent these dreams from becoming a reality. If we want to empower the formerly incarcerated and give them the means to free themselves from cycles of crime and poverty, we need to start having conversations and raising awareness about this issue in order for us to develop a movement challenging these oppressive licensing regulations that operate not just in California, but all across the country. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Anna Judson, and uh, I'd like to give a warm thank you for all of you staying uh, and hearing all of our presentations on, on structural exclusion in the US. Today I'll be presenting about the US foster care system and uh, elaborating a little bit on my work uh, academically and professionally to assist foster youth in the United States. Oh, uh, beginning uh, question I had when I applied to the Human Rights Center was uh, being asked how exactly foster youth rights fit into human rights. And uh, after taking a full course on uh, political rights in the United States, I got to see the way that the Convention on the Rights of the Child which was uh, ratified by the UN in the 80s, really held a key standard into uh, why protecting and supporting foster youth is crucial and is an element of uh, child welfare and uh, child well-being that can't be undone. Uh, Article 20 directly provides for the creation of uh, child welfare and emphasizes that Children that grow up in these systems will need added support and assistance. Over the course of my work with the National Foster Youth Institute as a Human Rights Fellow, I got to meet and work with, uh, closely with many foster youth in the United States, and I got to hear about their stories. Um, on this slide, you'll see an artistic representation of foster care by the former youth, who um, really uh, delved into the feelings and the um, crises that come from growing up in the system. Uh, th this includes pain, abandonment, trauma, uh, things that when you experience as a young person will stay with you for the remainder of your life. On the right, I have a, a word cloud of all of the things young people said to me that they needed assistance with or that they were not being um, properly supported in navigating. Uh, things related to reproductive justice, uh, pathways um, stopping incarceration or adverse detention for young people, housing, trauma, education, uh, disabled rights. These are really all um, problems that foster youth face disproportionately as a result of not having uh, full and adequate 
supportive living systems and uh, access to resources. Uh, today I'll be delving really quickly into the work I did in Washington, D.C. My role as a federal consultant um, doing federal child welfare research, deliverable successes, and um, overall how this summer went. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to show a quick video which explains the purpose of the National Foster Youth Institute. Since 2012, NFYI and the Congressional Caucus on Foster Youth have partnered to host the Congressional Foster Youth Shadow Day Experience, a multi-day event that brings current and former foster youth from across the country to Washington, D.C., where they share their personal experiences in the child welfare system with members of Congress. NFYI, or the National Foster Youth Institute, um, mobilizes foster youth, current and former, from 18 to 30 across the United States to really um, share their stories and experiences of their time in foster care and how that has impacted their lives so that we can work with decision makers to transform and rebuild the child welfare system and systems that impact youth and families in care. We're all super stoked to be advocating for our youth and the U.S. foster care system. Other foster youth need to have stable housing and stable basic needs and a family who loves them and can help them in their futures. I'm excited for this opportunity. I think without the people that are really impacted by child welfare, we can't understand how policies impact. The foster care system is very unique in that it's the only system that raises children, right? It's a bureaucracy that raises children. And we know that doesn't work and it's not effective. And until we partner with alumni of care, we won't be able to really understand and build systems that have good outcomes. To continue to grow the organization. Our original dream really was to have representation, that is youth delegates and family involvement in everyone. To these delegates that they are people. So thank you, and that was, uh, actually put together this summer. So those were all the 2022 delegates who got to fly to Washington, D.C. They were fully funded to meet with their member of Congress and speak about the issues most pressing to foster youth in their congressional district. This was also the first in-person Saturday we had since 2019. So it was really a, a joyous and powerful experience. And I was really proud when the advocacy and the momentum that we built in June while in Washington, D.C. didn't evaporate after we left. Uh, we continued with digital advocacy and or community organization and uh, troubleshooting some of the most pressing issue foster youth face, uh, like I shared earlier. In my work as a federal policy consultant, I was able to do uh, and provide research. So much of the National Foster Youth Institute requires pairing young people with their member. Um, and so uh, we also had to provide them with information on who their member was, their legislative history on uh, bills related to child welfare that they championed. And then uh, part of my role was also doing policy analysis on the problems young people were bringing to their member of Congress and to the organization and providing analysis uh, and synthesis of that information. Following that time, I think this echoes what a lot of the work of the fellows did. Uh, we decided to really narrow in on the language that was being used at the Capitol and making sure that the language was appropriate. Very often when you speak to former foster youth, uh, there are words like you were a troubled child, uh, problem, um, you know, and many other uh, identities and barriers uh, that go into um, that conversation and the language barriers that people who didn't grow up in foster care often don't understand how to discuss it. So I created a language guide with the help of the uh, delegates, which related to systemic quality, terms for discussing child welfare, and intersectional identities that comprise FYI. Uh, following that time, I, uh, this was the first year and FYI chose to send us to the United Nations Youth Assembly, where I got to meet with youth leaders and advocates around the world 
on a variety of different issues. Um, ours fit into the lens of economic and social justice in the US, but we also got to have an, a dialogue with youth leaders from all over the world. Uh, I understand everyone in this room comes from a wide variety of different backgrounds, and um, if at any part of this resonated with you or uh, the difficulties that foster youth in the United States face uh, in regards to inability to access resources, gain mentorship, meaningful employment, these are a widespread of nonprofits in uh, local, state, or nationally that are doing really powerful work to further foster youth rights. Um, and this can be in the form of mentorship. Uh, donations, um, land therapy, uh, legal advocacy, and uh, political advocacy as well, just recognizing that um, foster youth in the United States have faced uh, many barriers around getting uh, support, and it really is the duty of the system to make sure we're well cared for. Thank you. Um, all the presentations were great. Francis, this question is for you. Have there been any successful legal challenges to the licensing that, that your group has been a part of? Uh, sorry, can someone hear, can, can I be heard? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so in some of the initial legal research that we did, we found several other organizations. You're good, you're good. Oh, you're good. Okay. We found several other organizations um, that had a few successes, but they were they concerned like some occupations that did not really um, affect um, public safety as much. Now, some, some examples of occupations have been occupations such as African hairstyle breeding, where I think there are some requirements where you need thousands of hours of like a cosmetology degree, but very little of those skills that you use actually help you in the specific task of African hair braiding. So there wasn't any rational relationship of the regulation to the job that you ended up doing. Uh, those, ha those have had success. Um, specifically for the firefighting example that I raised in California, there was a recent like challenge to it, but because firefighting concerned like issues of public safety, there was a greater like deference to the licensing board for saying that people with a criminal history couldn't do it. So. I think a big part of it depends on the nature of the job that's that that's being like uh, in question for the licensing regulation. Thank you for that. Because I believe I saw a video regarding the, the firefighters from the prison, and the chief said they would hire them, but except for that. Yeah. I think you turn off that mic. It might help. This mic. No. Let's just keep talking louder than the feedback. <laughs> yes. Hello. The microphone feels silly because I have a really loud voice. Um, I have a question actually for Francis, but also for Caroline. So, Francis, I was wondering about the correlation between like strong union organizing. So, I'm thinking about people like United Brotherhood of Electricians, who actually doesn't have an occupational licensing discrimination for formerly incarcerated people. And the extent to which ACLU is actually partnering with unions like that who have successfully, you know, keep electricians are inside of people's homes, sometimes when they are not there, public safety concerns. Um, and then Caroline, I have a question about legal next steps that your group is working on. So should I go first? Okay, so thank you for actually asking that question because this was a novelty that I didn't present in my presentation because I thought I wouldn't have enough time. But in some of the initial engagements that with the ACLU team I was working with, with some of the states and local actors um, on this issue of occupational licensing boards, one novelty we found was that there are some labor unions that actually were our opponents on this specific issue. Like they were the ones who were defending these restrictive occupational licensing regulations that prevent the formerly incarcerated from trying to get these licenses. And I think some of the, ration, the initial rationales or reasons behind it, it was really just to help like restrict the supply of people who can enter like the occupation so that there's less pressure on wages. So that is like an issue that the folks in the team who are, who are working on this have to contend with when it comes to interacting with labor unions. We found it surprisingly that labor, some of the labor unions were like opposing this issue 
And the people that we learn more about the issue with and we have some initial positive engagement with are actually like conservative, economically libertarian politicians and organizations. It's like an interesting little like novelty for this specific issue. Yeah. Oh, and then just in general, like legal next steps. So I really like the full cycle of your argument, right? The storytelling that you did about really bringing to head the fact that this is still very arbitrary and capricious behavior on behalf of the court. Um, and so, yeah, I was just wondering, like, what are what are the next steps for your group, for that group? Yeah, well, so the the office that I was working at is a public defender's office, and their job is to just defend people who are accused of um, death-eligible crimes. But I think there's a lot that we can do, um, even in California. So, um, I mean, I do, I do not think that you can have a justice system that has a death penalty and engage in any kind of reform if that death, if the death penalty still exists. It's just having that as the ultimate pen penalty is... Um, it's, it's just kind of horrific. So um, as Californians, I'm assuming there aren't many Texans in here, but maybe there are, um, we still have um, prosecutors in certain counties bringing death penalty charges against um, defendants, even though our execution chamber has been dismantled. And so the best thing you can do is to get involved in those local prosecutorial elections. So I think San Bernardino County and um, OC Orange County are um, some of the more prolific uh, uh, prosecutors. Um, and the other thing is to push for a federal, the end to the federal death penalty. Um, the Biden administration told activists uh, in early January um, before he took office that they were planning on ending the death penalty um, and so far has pursued it, I think, in two cases. Um, and so I think the more that we can pressure the federal government to remove the death penalty, the more it will send a message to states like Texas um, that this just can't stand anymore. Next question. Over here, the professor in the back part of the room. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. I'm terrific, panel, everyone. So my questions, first of all, I want to ask, uh, um, and looking at the foster youth movement, yes. how about human trafficking? What's the issue there? So that'll be my first question. And then I just want to mention with Rhea, um, also to let everybody know, uh, probably about 20 years ago, one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Michelle de Tomas, uh, runs the uh, Vacaville uh, Center for uh, Death and Dying Patients in California's correction system. And she's been working on compassionate release. And I was really curious um, for Ria to tell us um, what, who starts that process? Does it have to be the, the, the inmate who's in, who's in detention and ill, and terminally ill, or can it be an advocate from outside? How does that process begin? All right, perhaps Anna first. Uh, thank you so much for that question, Professor Stover. Uh, so, Foster youth are among one of the most human trafficked populations in the United States. Uh, this is uh, largely because uh, the parents or the system, uh, the caretaker figure, uh, doesn't always isn't always able to keep track of the kid, and that they are um, disproportionately targeted as a result of having broken families, uh, often being low income. And uh, as a result of these circumstances, uh, they do very much uh, wind up becoming trafficked. And uh, I believe the last number I saw a couple years ago uh, was something upwards of uh, 20,000 foster youth were estimated to have been trafficked. And I forget uh, over how many years uh, that was true, but it definitely does speak to the volume of the problem and the way that the system does need to be changed uh, to better protect and serve youth and make sure that the circumstances driving this are less prevalent. Uh, I'd also like to highlight that uh, this is something that is being worked on by the Human Rights Center. So if, if for any of you here, especially at Berkeley Law, uh, there are ways to get involved uh, with uh, legal advocates who are trying to stop the rates of foster youth 
human trafficking uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, so thank you again for that question. Thank you for the question. So the application is started by people's primary care provider. Um, so a doctor that's working inside the prison. And, and that's why I also mentioned that physicians act as gatekeepers to this process. Um, one, I mean, there's an issue of um, do physicians working in the system even know that this is a mechanism? And do they see the humanity of the people they're taking care of to, to um, to start this application. Um, in the policy, it's also possible that loved ones um, can ask the chief medical executive at, at the um, institution that someone is incarcerated at um, to start the application. That's not something, that's not a pathway to starting the application that I've come across. Um, and, and so a really big barrier is um, physicians acting as gatekeepers to starting this process for um, for people who are eligible. Excellent. Next question, please. We'll come right over here. Hi, thank you guys so much for your presentations. They were all very interesting and also very upsetting. So I was wondering whether um, this is for any of you that had, if you had any experiences over the summer that gave you hope or any narratives of hope that you might be able to share with us. Uh, don't all go at once. Sure, I think um, having AB 960 be passed is hopeful. Um, and the and it doesn't get to the root of the issue, um, which is like what this policy, which is what like our world of policy and legislative change is so incremental that it's really hard to address the real issue, um, which is and which is rooted in mass incarceration. Um, and this is supposed to be a question about hope. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I find hope in seeing people who continue to organize and finding community in organizing spaces and continuing to push even when even when the path looks really difficult and hard to accomplish, um, that we continue to keep fighting in community. And that's, I think, that's the most hopeful thing there is for me. Um, I, I think it is um, important beyond just hope to think about also um, like the humanity of people in that moment. I think sometimes hope is looking forward and we forget about what's happening in the moment. Um, and I took a lot of strength from um, my clients and all of the funny and wonderful and kind things that they did for us in meetings or that I learned about them. Um, I think Brian Stevenson, who is like the poster child for a death penalty abolition, um, says his favorite thing to say is that you are more than the worst thing that you've ever done. And it was um, great to be reminded of that every time I met with our clients. Um, yeah, I think that hope was one of the key reasons I titled my presentation, The Foster Youth Movement in the US. Uh, it wasn't it was about 12 years ago where um, California didn't have a system of caring for youth when they turned 18. So the minute you turned 18, you were essentially given a trash bag and told, you know, your home is no longer funded for good luck going to college or whatever you do next. Uh, that was, uh, you know, displaced by AB 12, which provided funding from 18 to 21. And now I think we're at a really powerful point in uh, what many of my colleagues and close friends are calling the foster youth movement, where uh, because we, they were able to get those services at that time over the past decade, we are now able to advocate and show them, you know, quantitatively that those resources did work and that there are um, really positive pathways if the state can support us 
uh, in, you know, gaining meaningful employment or going to um, higher education. So um, I think a lot of the hope I see is among the alumni of foster care um, continuing to use their voice to advocate um, and to fight for better, even if we can't benefit from those resources, making sure the next generation um, has just as much, if not more. And I think for my specific issue, I just want to bounce off of uh, Ria's idea, um, because when it came to the specific firefighter issue that I raised in my presentation, uh, a bill was recently passed, I, I believe it's AB 2147, that allowed administrative agencies to like have like discretion uh, to consider other circumstances, not just mandatorily like bar anyone who has a criminal history. For, they're saying you cannot have like EMT certification or things like that. That gives that presents the possibility that there is space for like organizing and activism and policy advocacy on this type of issue but i mean just the concern is that there has to be greater awareness and organizing on this issue because of how broad and all income passing all of these occupational licensing regulations are uh, not just in the state of california and several hundreds of industries but in every single state in this country so it gives space and hope uh, in that front More questions from the audience, please. Yes, Violet, can someone bring Violet a mic? Thank you everybody for your uh, panel presentations. They're very informative and insightful. I have a question for Ria, but anybody else also can join. As human rights protectors or defenders who have to deal with death projects, how do you take care of yourself in the long term? Because this is um, this is very difficult to deal with, right? And, and for Rhea especially, who is into the medical field trying to save lives, how do you reconcile that? How do you take care of yourself? How do you deal with this? Uh, that is such a hard question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in this project, um, centering on who is mo what are the experiences of death and dying and who is most impacted by that um and thinking about my role and positionality in that context has helped me take care of myself in the work to um to know that um these are really traumatizing experiences that people are experiencing and what is it that I can do as someone who's not directly experiencing that um, trauma and harm and loss of loved ones what is it that I can do to help um, s support um, and within organizing and policy and research context um, and yeah, I think just centering on that and acknowledging acknowledging who should be at the center of the work has helped me keep perspective and, and continue to keep going. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just mentioned in my last one that I think a uh, huge uh, aspiration and hope I have for uh, changes to the foster care system is that foster youth alumni themselves will um, advocate for the changes they need most. And I think uh, with many of uh, individuals who have experienced foster care, uh, there is a very lifelong dynamic of childhood trauma that is difficult to separate. And so when you're working with young people and you're hearing just really, really um, upsetting stories about, uh, you know, not being able to uh, have a mentor or someone in your life that supports you, not having a home to go to for the holidays, um, to have any sort of like family structure or support, uh, it's really upsetting. And that's something I think all of us who work in human rights, we're going to experience some sort of uh, like very upsetting feelings. And so I guess it's, it's moving through that feeling. I think to me what's most grounding is keeping in mind that the, the work I'm doing is helping, even if it's incremental or it doesn't feel like it in the moment, um, and just kind of um, staying with that, that positive hope, uh, even if you're not seeing uh, crazy 
change in the moment, uh, knowing that you're working towards a larger goal of change. I, uh, I just want to give a shout out to uh, uh, former staff member of the HRC, Andrea Lampros, who's here today. She was one of the instigators of the resilience work that we do at the HRC, and uh, precisely this question has been a big question for us. How do you take care of yourself when you're seeing all kinds of gruesome and uh, upsetting things all the time, as is the world of human rights? And uh, HRC has, has grown a lot in that respect and come up with a lot of good ideas, and a lot of that is thanks to, to Andrea, so I just wanted to give you credit for that. Um, more questions, please. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for uh, all your presentations. It was really interesting. Um, first, I just want to say thanks to Anna for helping with the foster youth. I myself was adopted, so that was really nice to hear. Um, my question is very broad. Uh, so there's this pipeline of marginalized communities being sent to prison. And I was wondering, throughout your work, have you seen any progress in dismantling that pipeline? Um, I, I guess I could just like make a quick comment on that. I think the work specifically on challenging occupational licensing regulations is a means of, um, is part of like ch um, challenging or dismantling that pipeline because that pipeline is circular in the sense that if folks like enter into prison, they, they, they're marked with a criminal history and they, they leave and they try to like get a job and make an honest living for themselves, but these regulations prevent them from doing that, it, there's a likelihood of passing to the same types of activities and habits and groups that have placed them in crime in the first place. So that's how the pipeline becomes circular. So I think like I found and I found a lot of interest and passion in, act, in working more on this issue because like Challenge, like dismantling those types of regulations can be a way to prevent that aspect of the pipeline that makes it loop back to, to where a lot of marginalized folks began and started. Anybody else want to hit that one? Uh, I can go. Um, so I think it really largely depends on like the region and the area that you're working in, the area of law. Um, like broadly, I think rural Texas uh, is not necessarily um, experiencing a drop in executions or death penalty um, death penalty charges being brought, but Virginia recently abolished the death penalty, which like, you know, historically is just totally wild. Virginia was a very heavy user of it. Um, and I think separately from that, I, I was at the very end of the justice system, right? The sort of extreme, um, but there were a lot of similarities among our clients and our my organizations as a whole all of their clients um and one of the biggest i mean the biggest overlap is economic injustice um particularly in rural areas um and obviously there are overlapping spheres of identity that make that worse but i think um it's important to think about economically why people are in these situations in the first place and um, I'll just add that I, there's growing organizing from Black-led prison abolitionist movements and um, and leadership of formerly incarcerated people and um, who are doing a lot of work in California and across the U.S. to change and dismantle the systems that have harmed and um, harmed and impacted um, the people in their communities. Um, and to me, like, I look to that as, like, what are the movements that I need to support and um, that we all can support. Um, and the Racial Justice Act was passed um, in California. And um, there's also, uh, there was also a legislation that allows for um, voting rights to be reinstated for formerly incarcerated people and those are all efforts that are that were um led and organized by formerly incarcerated people and impacted people so just naming that leadership as the pathway to how we move forward 
Yeah, I think it was something uh, my organization we worked on over the course of the summer uh, in respects to uh, foster youth being overrepresented in uh, carceral settings, uh, and in part because of the uh, relationship between congregate care being a pipeline into the criminal justice system. Congregate care is a catch-all term for group homes, uh, residential treatment facilities, as well as other uh, larger congregate settings. Um, and so I think my project with NFII, uh, raising awareness to that, having space with young people to say, uh, this is my experience, uh, this is how uh, the juvenile justice or criminal justice system has directly impacted my life, uh, was powerful. And I think uh, there are some really amazing projects going on in DC, as well as in California and other uh, progressive states where foster youth advocates are really active pushing against that notion that if you are put in a congregate care setting that you will be over surveilled, um, you know, hyper uh, criminalized often and um, pushed into the juvenile justice system, which will then um, possibly lead to a lifelong relationship with the criminal justice system. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think there's a lot of different fronts that you can um, try to envision change and stop over incarceration. Um, that was one of them. Excellent. Any more questions in the crowd for this panel? Yes, come to you. Uh, hello. I um, really appreciated hearing all of you, and so I want just want to say that before I ask my question. Um, also, I am also I was also adopted, and so <laughs> yeah, international adoptee. But uh, I'm wondering where you, the panelists, see yourselves in your work in relation to the nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, we've been talking about that in one of my classes, and relatedly, how does, uh, how or how have grassroots movements informed the work you do? In what ways are you working with the people who are most affected? Um, I can start. Um, so I just wanted, so grassroots movements, and nonprofit complex. I actually regret starting because um, <laughs> as, as a public defender working in a public defense office, um, we are, I think we're a government organization, so we're not a nonprofit. Um, but my organization had a really cool model, which is that it, um, there's a big problem in capital trials, which is that we don't have um, a lot of public defenders in rural areas who are trained to be performing at that really complex legal level. Um, it just requires a lot of work and time to get to that. Um, and so in order to fund these lawyers and these um, special offices, um, my organization basically created this kind of insurance. So it convinced all of these rural counties in Texas to pay into a pot of money and then um, if uh, you decide, if a DA in your county decides to bring a capital case, um, the expense, and it's an extremely expensive process, is paid out of that pot. So it's sort of like a insurance mechanism that also made sure that um, a lot of people got much better and much more thorough uh, representation. Um, so it's not quite a nonprofit. Um, but it is a creative way of addressing this uh, legal problem. But um, I think I think the nonprofitees would be better at answering that question. Uh, yes, so I, I think it's appropriate for me to answer this question because the ACLU is, especially the national office, operates on such a high level. And you know, one of the obvious like obvious concerns when you operate at that high level is the difficulty of directly engaging with the local communities on the specific issues that you're concerned with. Uh, I guess one thing that I can say during my limited time in the ACLU is that 
one of the best ways that the ACLU tries to address that issue that it recognizes it has is it, it makes it a point to um, interact and engage with like lo its local affiliates because the ACLU has a national office, but it has like several like other offices in each state, like ACLU Nevada, ACLU North, North California, S S Southern California. Engagement with those affiliates who have greater connections to local communities and local grassroots organizations when it comes to addressing specific issues concerning racial justice or racial inequality. Uh, that is one of the ways where, where they try their best um, to engage and inform their approach to litigation when it comes to these issues. Um, I can't speak as much to the nonprofit industrial complex, but there's like a whole other set of problems with academia and research, which Victoria talked about earlier too. Um, I think the way I'm trying to approach my work is there's a lot of access to resources um, through institutions like universities and, um, and what can I do to connect and bring the resources closer to where communities are organizing and, um, and the policy and advocacy that people are working on. Um, so I think in, in the future, trying to think about how to make it more possible to bring the resources at the university uh, to where the change is happening and where people are trying to create change. Uh, I guess I'll end. I think this is a really excellent question, and it was one um, my colleagues and I were actually asking um, and have been asking over the past year. Uh, the nonprofit sector, as I think you could tell from the last slide of my presentation, has a very close relationship uh, with child welfare in that there are so many problems that uh, essentially what the answer comes down to is everyone throwing in, oh, well, we just need this new nonprofit and we can't do everything. So we can provide this one resource, which actually is why I had about eight nonprofits, which I would recommend if any of you are interested in looking into. Um, and uh, in a way, it's good. There's a nonprofit that can fit uh, anyone and their capacity to work with uh, current or former foster youth and help serve them. Um, however, I think it's also really problematic when, uh, you know, it does seem to detract from some of the rights we're fighting for and very often we become like shiny faces on postcards and pamphlets um, showcasing that they're doing so much to fix the issue when the reality is the uh, changes we need to see are, I think, in all of our instances going to take larger structural um, redress and um, policies to really um, help target the changes that um, our communities are asking for. So I think uh, the nonprofit uh, complex is a really good thing to critically question and um, push back against. And just uh, when you do interact with nonprofits, just make sure it's really uh, something you want to uh, devote your time and resources to. But I think there are also so many and I definitely wouldn't be in this room today without the help of nonprofits. Uh, love you, HRC. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is certainly really nice. Uh, well, the one more thing to I want to add is thanks to all of you for coming today and uh, listening to our fellows and being involved and learning more. Uh, you can learn more about uh, this program and all the things that the HRC does at our website. It's humanrights.berkeley.edu. You can sign up for the newsletter, which we send out like once every two or three weeks. It's not a lot of newsletters. You can also donate there if you want to. Uh, so please uh, get involved with the HRC and find out about all the other cool stuff that we are doing. And now we would like to invite you just around the corner to the reception at the Human Rights Center House is the charming uh, wooden house about halfway down this block. We'll be in the back in the Resiliency Grove with some snacks and some music, and you can meet and greet our fellows in the flesh there. So please come on down and celebrate with us, and everyone thank you once again.